uh, your what is it certif cert certification of occupancy from fire safety. Um, and I know that there's a number of people that don't have that stuff done that are pending, and I just want to remind everyone to kind of spend the next four four days getting that stuff in um, and work with your licensing agent to make sure that you have everything complete. Um, we will um, review for completeness um, those applications after July 1st to make sure that they are complete and we'll be dismissing the ones that are not complete by July 1st. Um, when it comes to renewals, and it, yeah, I should just once again reiterate that was for new um, outdoor and mixed tier applicants uh, that got in before the cutoff, not um, renewals. However, when it comes to renewals, we're kind of um, now seeing some of our first uh, renewals come through. Um, our licensing system was set up to automatically notify people um, a few months ahead of their expiration date. Um, this system had some kind of glitch in it that we're fixing, um, but those emails have not been going out automatically. We have been internally keeping a list of the people who are coming up for renewal and doing manual notifications. Um, however, um, if you don't, if you know your license is going to expire within a few months, please, and you haven't seen any indication of a renewal, you can reach out um, to the board, your licensing agent. Um, if you haven't seen any correspondence come in about your renewal, and of course, you know we we're not going to we're going to try our best not to let anyone's license lapse um, uh, because of a glitch. Um, wanted to mention um, just that we did our hemp tour, um, just wrap that up, hemp drive products. It was uh, very grateful to everyone who participated over the past two weeks. It was really great to see how hard this industry is working, how many products that are out there that are helping people. You know, I've said it a few times that no one at the board likes to act through emergency rule, particularly when um, it impacts people's ability to access products that they rely on therapeutically. Um, I think, you know, the feedback that we received uh, over the last two weeks and, and prior to that, since the issuance of that rule has been very instructive for us and also uh, reaffirming as to how we should proceed in the short and the long term. Um, wanted to mention about inventory tracking. Um, we've launched the new process for all license types. We decided early on um, to move away from the more traditional platforms. Um, we believe this decision was in the best long-term interest in Vermont, both from kind of a resource perspective and for our licensees. Uh, but we know that there's a learning curve for anything new. Um, we are in the process of developing tutorial videos that are specific to each license type, and they'll explain how you interact and comply with the inventory tracking platform. Um, it's my understanding that the first one of these videos um, will be up on our YouTube page by the end of next week. Uh, we've been getting a few emails about product registration. We know that our backlog has grown. Um, we've had some staff turnover. We've had some people who have been out um, and we've been onboarding new staff. Um, and that's really the kind of main driver behind this backlog. Um, we've made the decision uh to dedicate more staff to product registration um and so we are going to get through this backlog as expeditiously as possible um h270 um and what is now act 65 has become act 65 i know bryn walked through the major major changes at our last meeting um, and we have a summary document um up on the homepage of our website I would really encourage everyone in the industry to read the bill um, or at least the summary uh, because there are things in there that will have a significant and immediate impact on your operation. Things like packaging for edibles, um, who needs to get a tobacco license from liquor control, um, you know, the application of the 92% tobacco products tax, sometimes referred to as the vape tax. Um, I wanted to mention, though, that um, there were some modest improvements to the medical program, um, including opening up the ability for the board to um, make some meaningful changes to the rules and regulations that govern the medical program. 
We're not going to do that in a vacuum. We're going to hold a series of meetings um, this summer and fall um, with interested stakeholders to help craft regulations, but also to make recommendations to the legislature about how we can improve the laws that govern the program. So um, I know Priya from our medical team and, and others have been doing some outreach. Um, if you would like to participate in those meetings, please email um, us at ccb.med at vermont.gov. And we will, of course, um, keep our event calendar up to date when we have dates and times and, and links to those ready to go. So other than that, I think, you know, we've got a long meeting today um, and I think uh, we should get right into the agenda. Um, Julie and Kyle, have you had a chance to review the minutes from our regular board meeting in May and our um, special board meeting? Yes. Yes. All right. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, Ren, I think we'll start with you. Um, this is the last meeting of our um, previously adopted regular meeting schedule, and so we need to approve a new one for the kind of remainder of the year. Yes, that's right. And um, we have a slate of proposed dates for the remaining months of 2023. And I'm going to ask Nellie um, to help me with this list of dates. Uh, she will go through them one by one, and you guys can vote on them. I have a document that I'm just going to pull up on the screen <clears throat> really quick. Just give me one second. All right. Uh, you should hopefully all be able to see a list of dates right now. So they're all going to be uh, Wednesdays at 1 p.m. We have July 19th, August 30th. September 27th, October 25th, November 29th, and December 20th. Okay. Any, um, well, I guess, is there a, um, is there a motion to approve these meetings, this regular meeting schedule? I move to approve the meeting schedule as presented to us in this meeting. I second. Any discussion at all before we approve? Nope. No, nope, looks good. Thank you. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, okay. And Nellie, when you when you have a free moment, if that ever happens, could you just update our cal event calendar with those dates? Can do. All right. Great. Um, so I think, you know, next on our agenda is to review amendments of the CCB administrative rules. Um, I think, uh, you know, if history is a guide here, Gabe, this will fall to you to walk us through, um, the changes and the, maybe the com some of the comments that motivated some of these changes. And then, um, you know, I, I would suggest just given how long this historically has taken that, my advice is that we hold questions um, or I guess hold discussion until uh, Gabe gets through everything, let him get through. And then um, as he's going through, make sure you kind of, Julie and Kyle, write down the sections you want to visit or have comments on. And then we go back kind of and systematically review those uh, sections together. Okay. All right, here we are. I'll try to free up some screen real estate so that everybody can see if um, if uh, this renders too small on screens at home, please let us know and I can try to blow it up. Um, so as the chair said, we've got quite a lot to get through. There are three rules under revision. There are rules one, two, and four. Um, of the three, rule two has the most substantial content uh, to talk about. Um, rule one concerns licensing generally and has some 
some pretty simple amendments. Rule four concerns enforcement. So, uh, really so just in respect. Rule four is amended really just in respect to adding uh, some specificity about the appeal procedure. So one and four should be quick to move through. Uh, two will take some time. As the chair suggested, it's probably easiest if I walk everybody through each change and explain each one in brief. And then if you have questions about uh, any particular part, please note the section number. Um, and at the end, we can, we can go back through and clarify or, or dig into anything that folks might want to. Um, so turning to the uh, first amendment that you have in section one, there was a uh, the strikeout of the definition of employee. That's really a technical uh, amendment that was it was creating confusion about uh, who can get an identification card. It's really meant to apply only to one specific subsection of the rule. So the thought is that striking that general definition will make it easier to read the rule. Um, the change in de definition of outdoor cultivation has been uh, uncontroversial as far as I'm aware. And what you see here is the same as was proposed in the in the published uh, rule proposal. That is to get into some detail about the limited use of artificial lighting um, just to prevent flowering. Um, again, not aware of any uh, significant controversy there, so I'll move through that one quickly because I think most people involved have had an opportunity to um, uh, to familiarize themselves with it. The next amendments that you see in the definitions uh, concern how the board defines uh, who is a social equity applicant. Uh, that category of, of persons can receive certain benefits under uh, the board's guidance and by statute. Um, and really here, the board is clarifying what it means to be incarcerated. It sounds like it, off the cuff, you wouldn't Maybe think raise, that- Maybe hit the raise hand part. Um, I'm sorry. I think that was just a open mic, uh, flat mic. Thanks. Uh, sorry. So, uh, social equity, the, the changes to the definitions here are meant to clarify what it means to have a qualifying incarcerative sentence. And the board has, has clarified, and this is consistent with its past decisions when it's taken up the matter uh, on a case by case basis, that incarceration means actual served incarcerative time as a result of a sentence, not pretrial detention, and incarceration that occurs in a jail or prison facility. Uh, so if one uh, receives a sentence of home furlough, for example, that wouldn't um, constitute incarceration for the, for the purposes of the rule. Um, the board has gone on to elaborate a little bit about upon what it means to be a social equity business applicant and has clarified here that uh, ownership has to be at least 51% by a social equity individual applicant. That is not a change in the law. The underlying federal code already contained that requirement, but few readers would know to dig into the uh, underlying federal code from which this is adapted. Um, and so saying it out loud is helpful to prevent confusion. Um, finally, the board has uh, tried to offer more clarification, again, consistent with decisions already made and interpretations already given in, in cases concerning the topic, what it means to be from a community that has been disproportionately affected by cannabis prohibition. Um, and there's a lot of ambiguity around that term community and what can constitute a community. And so the effort here is to be a little bit more clear about that. And I think fairly summarized as we're talking about born or imposed circumstance, not uh, voluntary participation in uh, club advocacy organization, hobbyist group following a particular style of music, et cetera. Um, and so that's what the board is getting at here, I think. And so hopefully this will add, lend a little bit of clarity to applicants in deciding whether or not they're candidates for the social equity applicant status. Um, the amendments that you see here to rule 1.1.4, um, the first is technical. The second simply reflects the assignment of statutory authority over hemp derived cannabinoids um, and potentially intoxicating hemp products to the board. And down in 1.3.1, you see there's a strikeout of that narrow piece concerning mixed cultivators. Uh, rephrasing of, uh, of the uh, discussion of uh, what a tier two manufacturer can and can't do. 
um, clarifying that uh, that uh, supercritical CO2 extraction as well as the other methods um, are not available at that tier. Um, a little bit of clarification about changing tiers um, also has been in the rule since the original amendment proposal, and I'm not aware of any controversy related to it. In 1.4.5B, you can see a strikeout of the uh, express escrow provision. In 1.4.9, um, you can see the when we were talking earlier about why employee, the definition of employee was struck from the general definition section, it's reinserted here where it is meant to, <laughs> where it's meant for. Again, there to, to avoid confusion. <clears throat> Uh, you can see there also a, a part of the original proposal and so far uncontroversial as far as I'm aware, uh, a proposal to allow that a plan to pay applicable taxes on behalf of a medical patient uh, who is duly registered may be one among the several kind of uh, good deeds that a retailer may do um, as part of its positive impact um, plan. Uh, 1.7 is amended again, really to reflect the board's um, statutory authority over amperite compounds. One point nine e is amended again as it was in the original uh, to uh, strike the uh, obligation of a plan to contribute fifty thousand dollars to the uh, to the cannabis business development fund. That October one uh, date has come and gone. Uh, next amendment you find is 1.11.3. This is about the uh, criminal convictions that would be presumptively disqualifying. The board in this case is uh, just trying to articulate an objective standard by which those decisions will be made. And the standard that they have landed on is kind of the common sense one, I, also, I think also reflective of the statute, that what they're really testing is whether an applicant uh, will pose a threat to the safety of the legal cannabis market or the general public. They're not sitting in moral judgment of whether somebody's taking responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. That's for the courts. Um, so that's why you see uh, that amendment. In 1.15.1b, uh, just a technical amendment to avoid the appearance of any loophole associated with promises of uh, notifications about expiring licenses, just affirming the principle that even if the uh, licensee doesn't receive reminders that a license is expiring, the license still expires. It's the duty of the licensee to know the expiry date. Um, <clears throat> in subsection E, this is a fairly kind of a technical and legal uh, adjustment. Uh, we've added the qualifier and complete to um, the provision that if a licensee files a timely and complete renewal application without getting an action, you know, without a decision from the board, uh, the license continues in effect. Uh, this change was necessary really for two reasons. One, it matches the Administrative Procedure Act statute from which uh, this rule is derived. Um, so one actually has to complete the application when you couldn't file you know, the first page of it and just to hold the door open and say that the license is still active. Um, so that's, that's why you see that provision there. Um, change is nothing in substance because that already was the Administrative Procedure Act um, language. Uh, technical rephrasing here that doesn't bear getting into. Uh, 1.17A1, uh, here the uh, effort is to add a sentence clarifying that there are certain de minimis changes that just don't call for the elaborate process of uh, of filing a renewal application, uh, one still has to tell the board about those changes, but they don't they don't necessarily provoke uh, the full vote reapplication process. And then the waiver provisions uh, for tier one cultivators, there's um, I think a long history here, but the general thrust is not hard to understand. It's the, uh, there's a significant policy interest in making sure that the marketplace is accessible to tier one. Uh, cultivators, and so there was some uh, some leeway given there. I know there was a lot of discussion about that uh, as these were developed. So there you are in rule one. Um, Mr. Chair, do you want me to stop by rule, or would you rather I go through all, all three? And...
You're muted, Pepper. Uh, yeah, why don't you go through all three, Gabe? So we're here we're into rule two, and as I kind of warned, this is the one with the most activity in it. Um, we've received a lot of comments about aspects of this, some of them really helpful and provoked thought, and, um, and in some cases in the month the rule has been pending, just changes in the uh, marketplace have, have led to the suggestion that things be updated. So we'll try to walk you through what we've got here in an efficient way, and then we can dig into anything that I've um, glossed over at the end. Uh, amendment to 2.1.2, again, reflects the statutory assignment of responsibility to the board for, for the oversight of synthetic and hemp-derived cannabinoids. Um, 2.1.3a, there's a, a new definition for adulterated. The term is used throughout the rule, um, especially in regard to when things become reportable. Um, and so it was felt that it was important that it be clearly defined. The definition you have here is a uh, sort of a merging of the federal definition uh, in the FDCA or used by the FDCA and the, um, the, the definition of adulterated in the health and ag titles. So that's what we have here, but it, in general, it means something is wrong with the product and especially that the strength, quality, purity, ingredients, or composition that are represented or expected uh, aren't there or that what is there is not consistent with the labeling. Um, so the definition becomes important because it guides what um, uh, what triggers certain other uh, uh, events in, the, in case something is adulterated or deemed adulterated. <clears throat> As you uh, in the original proposal, clone was defined for the first time. We had some uh, helpful feedback that uh, said not all clones are growing in the water solution. Uh, they can't yet be root bound, but as we all know, clones are for sale in soil. Um, so that correction is sort of there to reflect reality. The, um, the uh, definition of distillate is added. The definition of full spectrum is added as originally proposed, but there is one change, which is that we had feedback concerning chlorophyll. Um, and it's my understanding, I think it's been checked out, that there are products that all folks in the field would regard as full spectrum uh, that don't have chlorophyll in them uh, really just because of its solubility or not in the same uh, solvents that, that, the, that uh, assist in making the other extracts. So that's kind of technical, but should hopefully avoid um, uh, creating problems for folks making those products. Uh, harvest lot is defined with the purpose really of uh, letting that definition be applied to the testing requirements that are developed elsewhere in the rule. Isolate is defined. Outdoor cultivation is uh, defined or redefined differently in order to account for the minimal use of the lighting to prevent flowering. Exact same thing that we were talking about with re in respect to the rule one definitions. Process lot is defined. Uh, this is again because we're going to have a section uh, on testing that uses the term. And so clarification about what the term means uh, is helpful and necessary. And tincture is defined and in conformity with the uh, with some of the H270 changes, the milligram cap is uh, is adjusted on part accordingly. Um, the applicability of the rule, the section discussing the applicability of the rule is amended um, just to, to avoid technical and legal conflicts. Basically says anybody that's licensed uh, pursuant to rule one. <clears throat> The insurance requirements in 2.2.2 are amended slightly. Um, the board will publish guidance in consultation with the Department of Financial Regulation about what constitutes commercial, commercial reasonableness uh, in various contexts. And so we wanted to clarify that. Um, <clears throat> the escrow requirements are updated. Um, there's a clarification in sub D that escrow has to be held by a third party. Money that's held by the uh, person himself that can be put to any use isn't truly escrow. Um, and then a clarification that um, the escrow can only be dispersed in accordance with guidance issued by the board. Same idea, the point of escrow is that it can't be used for any purpose at any time. It has to be uh, held aside uh, for special contingencies. Um, 
coming to we're coming to some sort of the meteor uh, amendments. This one, I think, bears particular attention from uh, board members and participants. It has been uh, a, a significant source of commentary because I think it would it would have some non-trivial effects on people and uh, the products that would be available in the marketplace. Um, so you can see there's an addition among the health, safety, and sanitation requirements are added first to sub B, which is that um, producers have a have recall procedures in place appropriate to ensure that adulterated or dangerous product can be called back from the point of cultivation or manufacturing through efficient communication uh, with downstream trading partners. That just means sort of want to know who uh, who product was sold to and have a system in place, not unlike that uh, in place from drug manufacturers and whatnot, whereby if a batch went out bad and needed to be called back, there'd be an efficient way to do it. It's really a record keeping requirement. Um, <clears throat> and that would be enforced at the point of inspection. I think inspectors would be able to ask uh, before the recall plan or, or procedure. <clears throat> the uh, sub E uh, would prohibit the production of a, a cannabis product that includes a nutritional supplement, drug product or additive that may provoke drug interaction, undermine shelf stability, or suggest curative effects. Um, that does mean that uh, such things as a uh, gummy that merged melatonin and uh, THC uh, would not be uh, permitted were this adopted in this form. Uh, the, we've additionally prohibit uh, any products that contain meat or meat products um, and dairy products as defined in Title VI. Um, there's a clear definition of when a the dairy product ceases to be a dairy product. And so it's useful just to hitch onto that well understood um, definition. <clears throat> uh, and also a prohibition on products requiring time and temperature control for safety. Um, a provision that uh, documentation may be required for pH and water activity if requested by the board. And uh, the uh, documentation be provided. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if there are any concerns about uh, uh, the, the biological concerns with product manufacturing process. Um, these, I think, will provoke a lot of conversation later today. Um, and the underlying problem with which most people are familiar is that because of the federal status of the cannabis, um, the usual uh, minders of the beet uh, in food safety uh, are not available to do their work. And, and uh, so it becomes a question of sort of administrative feasibility and safety, but that's really a policy discussion that I'll leave for the end. <clears throat> a final safety addition to the safety requirements section is that if co-located in a residence or building outside of DFS jurisdiction, this really means a residence um, that's not a public building, um, the operation would have to have operating smoke detector detectors at least equal in number to operating security cameras and would have to refrain from employing hydrocarbons in extraction. So for practical purposes, that means it would have to be a uh, public building, meet the standards of a public building for those activities uh, to go on for, uh, for hydrocarbon extraction to occur. Um, and, and in residential grows, there would be enhanced uh, uh, smoke detection. Uh, that arises from concern, I think, both from our inspectors and from fire safety itself, that uh, in-home cultivation presents certain risks of fire, and yet there's not really anybody there uh, uh, making sure that those are appropriately mitigated. Um, the, employing, the employment and training sections are largely left alone. There's a typographical cor correction to 2.2.7. We have the original um, proposal to amend the warning label. Uh, this also will require some discussion by the board um, after this summary. We're required to confer with the Department of Health in the development of these, um, and we're, um, you know, we've kind of been partially successful in reaching out to the right folks there. Um, and I think there may be some further discussion about whether we're where we want to be in terms of the ultimate amendments. Um, and so we may want to just slow down and talk about what's going on with labeling. At that point, I know there's been a lot of concern because we've heard it in comments 
about not um, abruptly changing requirements in a way that requires people to throw out printed uh, labels and whatnot. And so be assured that whatever happens, whether or not the board decides to um, to make the adjustments to the label and this is, that are discussed here now, um, there will at least be a provision like what you see here in 2.2.10D that allows a run that allows folks um, with uh, labels that have been rendered non-compliant to continue to use them and spend them down for a year. Um, so that's what this section uh, is all about. <clears throat> uh, simple amendment that was in the original proposal uh, for 2.2.11, uh, striking that limitation in sub E. Really just technical rephrasings. Here in 2.2.18G, uh, narrow exception is made to allow co-location for mentorship and accelerator programs. 2.2.19A is the first um, section to kind of jump on that concrete definition of adulteration to provide that all licensees should make a prompt report to the board upon discovery of adulterated cannabis or cannabis product, regardless of cause or fault. And uh, what is meant there really is that nobody's necessarily in trouble, uh, won't necessarily provoke a, an enforcement action to make a report. Uh, the important thing is to make the report and, and let things flow from there. So that's why you see that, um, uh, why you see that language uh, where it is. <clears throat> Another technical change of importance to the um, kind of ag safety and, and occupational safety folks is uh, that cannabis once found to contain actionable level, levels of aspergillus uh, should be labeled that way. And the label needs to travel with the product so that other uh, people and employees in the chain will be aware that uh, the, the product could be hazardous to them, especially people who are very uh, uh, sensitive. So really a reminder here added in 2.2.21 about product uh, licensing and registration. Um, uh, general provision uh, asserting the board's authority to impose appropriate security requirements. Um, and then a clarification uh, that articulates decisions already may sort of codifies decisions and interpretations already made about the one location rule. That's a, obviously an important for feature of Vermont's uh, licensing program. And this clarification addresses what happens when somebody um, has locations that are very close, how, how close is too close or how separated is too separated uh, as at a point that would offend the one location rule. As you can see, the, uh, the language proposed would clarify that this will be done based on spans, the familiar unit of property taxation. Um, and I'm, I'm not aware of any significant commentary or controversy about that, but it is a, uh, notable because of the underlying or the under the importance of the underlying one location uh, pool. Um, <clears throat> a requirement that uh, uh, packaging must include the cultivator's license number and process lot number. That's a kind of a common sense uh, way to ensure supply chain integrity and, and uh, call things back if they're problematic. Seeing mostly technical changes here, just to, instead of listing out some licensees, just to see. Um, the addition you see to 2.3.9 uh, has been made in response to feedback that we really hadn't accounted in the sampling uh, rules for uh, competitions. Think of the Cannabis Cup, for example, where a panel of judges uh, would be evaluating samples of product. Um, this new section, sub C, would, you know, parallels those provisions for vendors and employees and provides a rule for competition samples. As you can see, it's set at twice the employee limit. So instead of four grams per strand per flower, uh, eight. And, um, and the rest of the proposal there speaks for itself. 
Um, but that, again, was an effort to, to cover that contingency, which the old rules did not. Uh, the personal use rule 2.3.10, uh, which kind of operationalizes section 4230E, uh, allowing for personal use uh, or allowing uh, folks to grow for personal use is amended to clarify that there has to be physical separation from the site of commercial operations and unambiguous labeling. Um, and then a reminder that that personal use uh, uh, product or flower uh, stays out of the inventory tracking system. And the reasons for that are kind of self-explanatory, very hard to, um, uh, virtually impossible to enforce a distinction between uh, one's commercial grow and personal grow uh, unless they're physically separated. So the inspectors can't, uh, aren't worth guessing. Um, <clears throat> turning to 2.6.3, these are manufacturer labeling requirements. Um, uh, Provision similar to the one we just discussed, uh, requiring that the manufacturer's license number and process lot number be printed. That's obviously for traceback purposes. Um, and then suggestions to uh, to add labels to uh, concentrates in vape cartridges, as you see here. Uh, and then an express prohibition. I say express because they're already uh, prohibited by rule, uh, but an express prohibition on disposable vape pens and uh, other disposable vaping devices and then a, a clarification of what that means right there. <clears throat> Section 2.6.4 concerns additives and uh, subsection A is amended for really technical reasons so as not to contradict other sections of the rule. Um, an absolutist read of A would say that additives but in other, any additive that was generally regarded as safe by FDA, no matter what hazardous characteristics it might have in context, couldn't be prohibited. So obviously it makes sense to um, qualify that with the clause that you see. In sub B, the, uh, the board uh, clarifies that it will keep a schedule of approved and disapproved ingredients that will be readily available to the public. Uh, prior to this amendment, we were just talking about approved ingredients and in terms of just um, practicality, it is sometimes a lot easier to, to, to list out disapproved compounds and substances uh, rather than approved ones. So that um, sort of commonsensical. Um, finally, a terpene limit. Um, this is subsection C. So the total terpene content of a Gano's product intended for inhalation or vaporized formulation may not exceed 10% by weight. Um, all terpenes added to a cannabis product must be naturally occurring in the cannabis plant. Any concentrated terpenes added to a cannabis product should be disclosed on the label. So that 10% uh, rule, I think, follows uh, rule in New Jersey. It's a little bit, pardon me, a little bit more permissive than the 5% rule that has been embraced by some other states, um, but is meant to get at that, uh, at the question of additives and what the consumer ought to be able to know about terpenes uh, added uh, from elsewhere. So just a technical change in 2.6.6, it doesn't bear getting into. Uh, change in 2.8.2 that clarifies you don't have to keep your own front door locked for the customers to walk through. So um, <laughs> it's, um, well that doesn't require too much explanation. Um, uh, just the elaboration on the heading so that people know that the information about customer personal information is in that section as well. And we're into employee samples. This was, um, uh, I think, part of the original proposal as well. Uh, but a provision that retailers uh, may provide samples to an employee to determine whether to make the product available to sell, provided that such samples may not be consumed on any licensed premises. I know that I recall a thoughtful comment on that section that sort of said, well, nobody's actually giving uh, samples so that they can decide whether or not to sell the product. They're really trying to educate the employees on the characteristics of the product. So that, um, I just wanted to raise that because I recall it coming in and that may be a, a, a minor issue, but one that the board might want to think about as you roll through this. Um, <clears throat> and then limits on the aggregate uh, calendar month 
samples available to an employee. Those will be five grams of concentrate or extract or 100 servings of edibles per employee, provided that the content of each has to be in the, it doesn't exceed the five milligrams per serving um, and, you know, fits within potency limits generally. Um, and I think we had commentary, you know, suggesting that that was too big and too little. <laughs> so um, we, we've, I think, heard both things on that topic, but that's where things would be set right now as proposed. Uh, a requirement that uh, samples be labeled um, and that they be tracked in inventory tracking. Now, here comes the probably the most interesting of the amended sections. Uh, the board has kind of redone its testing section. Um, we've removed a graphic flowchart that was a little bit confusing um, and replaced it with text because of the way the word processing program marks up these changes. It's going to be a lot easier for readers, I think, if I switch off the markup and just show you what the um, uh, what the proposal is in in black text. Uh, this uh, graphic that may be familiar from the old rule would be gone. <clears throat> So let me do that now before we start talking about the content of the testing requirements. And here as well, we had some uh, some interesting and, and helpful commentary that's quite recent that I, I think we'll want to be sure to discuss deliberately. Okay. All right, there's a more reasonable version, and this does again doesn't show the markup, but shows what it would look like in final. Um, so there's a preamble in 291 that clarifies that the board, you know, kind of exists as a board, among other things, to be able to respond nimbly to new developments that may call for different kinds of testing. For example, if there's a novel pathogen that needs to be monitored, um, if there's a specific concern about a specific kind of contamination that wasn't covered before, the board would be able to use its guidance to, um, to steer laboratories and licensees into getting the appropriate uh, tests done. Um, we say here once, and you'll, I point this out now because it's taken out elsewhere where it was redundant, that uh, any change to that guidance should presumptively take effect at least 90 days after its announcement and publication. We don't want to pull the rug out from any under anybody. There are transition costs associated with decisions like that. Um, and so that's going to apply to any change in the guidance that we're talking about. Um, but the effort is to lay down the, the kind of broad tracks uh, in the rule with the understanding that uh, guidance could could be used to adjust to changes in changes in the world that move a little faster than the rule. <clears throat> so what we'd have here is that uh, for general harvest lots, all cultivars would have to be individually tested for potency and pathogens. But up to five simultaneously submitted cultivars may be commingled by the laboratory, not by the um, submitting uh, or the client or customer, but by the laboratory itself uh, for pesticide testing. There was some discussion about whether pathogen testing should be part of the um, commingling, uh, but the information that we are getting is that uh, fails are common enough that that would be self defeating and it wouldn't actually save anybody any money uh, or offer any efficiency to businesses. So uh, that's why you see what you do. <clears throat> For mechanically extracted or infused process lots, um, the final potency must be tested and harvest lot pesticide and pathogen COAs travel with the extract. For uh, solvent extracted process lots, uh, these four elements here, pesticides, residual solvents, potency, and heavy metals are to be tested. For manufactured process lots, COAs from all process lots in the manufacturing process must be associated with the manufacturing process lot. And for finished edible products, harvest lot or process lot COAs would have to travel with the product and there would have to be testing of final product potency and uh, potency consistency, another way of saying homogeneity. Um, and in parentheses, we recognize that that the guidance will have to be developed around the product types, just simply saying that you're going to have the same kind of homogeneity testing uh, across the diversity of products out there would, would not be possible. <clears throat> so then we're into potency parameters that I think are, are familiar. I don't think there's anything um, significantly changing there. Um,
And similarly, the board has uh, sort of reserved to guidance the action limits to be assigned to the metal contaminants. And I think that, yeah, that gets you to the end of the testing amendments. Um, those were significant because that whole graphic has been replaced with uh, text now. So having been through that, I'll turn the market back on so that uh, because I think it helps more than it hurts in the rest of the other sections. So an express uh, requirement that labs maintain certification. Some technical rephrasing. Section 2.15 is amended to reflect uh, relocation of the confidentiality provisions to Section 901A rather than 901. You'll see that a few other places. And 2.17 brings us to the next um, significantly controversial section of the rule. This is the addition to Rule 2 of what is now the uh, emergency the active emergency rule on synthetic and hemp derived cannabinoids. Um, if everyone familiar with the emergency rule will be familiar with this text because it's cut and paste um, with renumbering, of course. Um, and the only real difference is just a clarification that taxation would be part of the, the kind of a common sense uh, statement that that goes along with being a registered regulated cannabis product. Um, so there's a, I know this has provoked and will provoke a great deal of discussion. And I know that there um, we've explored options in other states, including uh, the safe harbor approach taken in Colorado and a couple of other states. So I expect that um, the board will probably want to discuss um, those in some detail when the time comes. Um, I assure you, we are mostly through it. The, um, the last one is rule four. So we can kind of, uh, Take a stretch at this point, but um, I, don't know, I don't know how you have that coat on going through all this. It's like 85 degrees in here. So yeah, take it off if I you need to. Um, <laughs> I may take your invitation. For that. Yeah. Um, thank you. So here we are with for, for those of you uh, lucky enough to be joining our model. It's incredibly hot. Um, I don't know. <laughs> doesn't feel like it works. So rule four is the compliance rule. Not much is changing. Here. Um, as a matter of fact, I can tell you in two spots what's changing. Um, there is an addition of a procedural section concerning how appeals work, and there is an express prohibition of, uh, on altering COAs, which is already wrong and illegal <laughs> and would cause trouble. But here you can see 4.5.2 uh, among the long list of, um, of thou shalt nots in category one. These are sort of the more serious, the most serious of the categories um, of violation, altering, manipulating, or falsifying a COA. Uh, no need to explain why that ought to be prohibited. Um, and then we get down to the administrative appeal process. Um, this, I think, is welcomed by some of us internally because it really offers a little bit of structure about how administrative appeals from final decisions of the board would work. Um, you'll notice here that we've set a party to a contested case, which is implicit in the word party, but um, the point here is that what is appealable is important. Under the Administrative Procedure Act, a contested case is one in which the rights of an individual or a company are to be adjudicated by the board after a hearing. Um, so if there's been a hearing, uh, the decisions of the, of the board can be appealed from. What can't be appealed from are kind of quotidian decisions of the board, like what kind of pens to buy or what color to paint the walls or something. This would really, be, the clarification here is that this really applies only to the appeal right and statute applies to final decisions of the board in contested cases, and the challenge may be brought by uh, a party, then that almost always going to mean the respondent in this context. That's important because, for example, if you were a frustrated complainant uh, whose complaint was not acted upon or something, you're not a party to the administrative proceeding, and you would not be able to appeal from it. 
Um, so a long, long way of saying that the people affected are the people that can appeal and that this applies to uh, enforcement in the sense of administrative sanctions, suspension, etc. Um, so, uh, and the text here follows and is adapted based upon uh, very similar appeal procedures used by the Office of Professional Regulation and Occupational Professional Licensing, by the Medical Practice Board, et cetera. Um, it also parallels uh, provisions in the Administrative Procedure Act, which is the chapter um, of state law that governs how fair hearings in the at the administrative level are conducted generally. So um, a lot of a lot of what it's doing is bringing to ground uh, general principles that are already the law under the Administrative Procedure Act, but that are a bit obscure for readers, if not pointed out here. Um, so the record on appeal is everything that went before the board. Um, uh, the transcript has to be provided if, if necessary. So that the and appeals are on the record, meaning uh, if an appeal occurs in this context, it's not a rehearing, it's not a de novo hearing, uh, it's a review of whether the, by a, a third party of whether the board erred in a significant way in one of the uh, enumerated uh, number of ways in making its decision. Um, so then the rule goes on to specify that there'll be an appellate free hearing conference useful for ordering uh, things, making sure everybody's on the same page. There'll be a briefing schedule, which is the exchange of uh, two 15 page double spaced briefs. And then there is uh, a hearing and a decision. There is a narrow provision, and this is found in the parallel statutes as well, uh, statutes and administrative rules concerning administrative appellate procedure, allowing that the appellate officer in really extraordinary circumstances could reopen the evidence um, to take additional evidence um, concerning irregularities in the procedure that are not otherwise of record. So that wouldn't be to re-argue what was argued before, uh, but rather to address something that for one reason or another didn't get in the record. Um, so that's what you see there. And um, so as, as uh, promised, that's everything with four, uh, mostly procedural and technical, but useful um, in terms of what the board's procedure will be in appeals. So I think that's a wrap. Um, I can I can unplug and turn things back over to the chair. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you for doing that, Gabe. Um, I know I could use a little bit of a break. Um, and you know the air conditioning in this smaller conference room does work if you guys want to move in there. Um, we got it. Pretty... We got it working okay. now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, Julie and Kyle, do you mind if we take just a 10 minute break quickly before we get into the substance of the rule? No. OK, so why don't we come back at uh, 210? Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, is everyone back? Yep, back. All right. <clears throat> Recording is still rolling, so we're good to just get get started again. Okay. Um, let's see, it's uh, two o nine p.m. Um, June twenty sixth, twenty twenty three. Um, we're just resuming a meeting. We took a quick break. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, thank you for reviewing those rules, Gabe. Um, I know that over the past few months since they were published, we've also received a number of written comments. Um, I'd also like to uh, take a moment. Um, I know in our agenda, we were going to take some oral comments one last time just about some of these provisions um, or about whatever is on people's minds. But could you just kind of describe a little bit about how we as a board are considering and what we do with those written and, and oral comments that we received throughout the process? I'd be happy to, thanks. So um, the overarching theme of this 
process and procedure is that it's meant to maximize public participation and input so that nobody's taken by surprise and that there's full public notice of what the agency intends to do in terms of the rules that it is promulgating and intends to adopt. Um, so that that we take feedback a number of different ways. Um, one is at the two public hearings that were held um, on, the, on the published rule proposal. Um, another is in writing. So for a period of months, um, which we can now in fact reopen, we accepted uh, public comments at ccb.info at vermont.gov. And those comments go around to uh, members as they're received so that they're all known. Um, I know that the board in the past had done kind of an itemized look at each public comment. I did not plan that for today, in part because it's not required, and in part because the, well, simultaneously because it's not really required by the APA, and because we have so much to get into here, too. Um, but I want to make sure the commenters know all of the public comments are compiled, they're put together. They have to be filed with the uh, Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, and our filing has to be accompanied by an explanation, which I'll prepare, of each substantive point made for and against the adoption of the rule, and then whether the agency has amended the rule in response to the comment or whether it's decided not to and why. Um, so all of that is transparent to the legislative committee. The whole package of commentary goes to them. So if anybody's written to us at any point in this process and has made it clear that their comment is meant for public comment, it's in that collection. Um, and atop that collection is a summary of the points made and the reasons why things were done or not done. Um, anyone who made public comment who would also like to share that commentary during public comment in this meeting um, is welcome to do so orally, of course. Uh, but I just want to make sure people knew the fate of the rule uh, or the fate of their comments, that they're taken seriously, that they're seen, have been seen, and ultimately get right into the administrative record that's seen by everybody. Um, to that end, I might suggest to you, Mr. Chair, that you consider deferring final approval of rules one and two. Um, and this is in keeping with what we we're talking about, uh, about the notice function of this process. We published uh, what was intended months ago to be our final amendments to these two rules. And we've had a lot of activity since. Uh, we've learned new things since. We've had commentary. Uh, that led us to, to change what we were proposing. We've added the emergency rule uh, to rule two, uh, which is something we didn't know we would be in the position to, to do when the rule was initially published in newspapers, et cetera. So I think it might, to just in keeping with the idea that we want to maximize public participation, there's a lot to recommend deferring action on a final approval of one and two to your July meeting um, in order that, um, uh, you know, in order that folks that are participating now can know what I just said. Some of them were learning about that for the first time. That's the first notice they got of it. And we want to make sure they have time to comment on the amendments made in response to comment if that isn't too certain. So, um, so I, uh, you might want to consider that. I don't know if there's an obligation to hold it over another month, but so many changes have been made uh, that there's a lot to recommend. Uh, thanks for that. And th that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, um, especially if, uh, you know, in this meeting today, we, we received substantive public comment on things that people are seeing, maybe ca catching for the first time after you just reviewed it all and based on changes that, like you said, like we made today. So um, I think I will suggest that we defer final action um, on approval of these rules, um, which would be sending them over to LCAR, I think is the next step in the process um, until next next month's meeting, which is in, um, July 20th? July 19th. 19th. July 19th. 19th. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, well, um, I think what I would like to do before Julie, Kyle, um, and I start kind of opening up the rule and having our discussion is to open the floor to public comment. Um, and again, the, the most helpful comments that we can get right now are about these rules. Um, but of course, and we will have another public comment section, a more general one at the end of this meeting uh, when we always do. But I, but I think if people have comments that are specific to this rule, um, you know, please raise your virtual hand if you join via the link. Um, and then if we get through those, um, we'll move to the folks that join by phone.
have Robert up first. Can you hear me? We can hear you. OK, thank you very much. One, I wanted to say that I appreciated you clarifying the uh, the rules about the conversion or the transition of packaging. I think that's very helpful. I know it's been a topic uh, that we've been having internally and with other people, other growers um, over the past couple months. So I'm glad to see there's not a cliff approaching there, but it's very helpful. But in the context of uh, testing and how that integrates with the inventory tracking, which is already kind of assuming these rules are going to get adapted, it might be helpful to make sure that the similar types of transition concepts are kind of built into these rules as well. For instance, people are already have uh, plants in the ground. By the time, I'm not sure whether the rules will be adopted by the time that some of these tests uh, need to be submitted. So I'm not sure whether that's the old rules or the new rules. Or for indoor growers who have issues like this and who are live right now with doing certain things, they also have issues with transition about what to follow in terms of, you know, uh, how they're keeping track of different process lots and, and harvest. Well, harvest lots is, is pretty is pretty straightforward, but the process lots, different process lots for biomass, for for flour, and, and for a number of other things, and to make sure that the everything lines up, both the inventory tracking, the testing that's going to be required, uh, because a lot of indoor people are probably going to have a crop coming due midsummer, which which will definitely be before these are adopted, and exactly what needs to happen there should be clear and also how is there a grandfathering clause for flour that's produced with those tests you know does it have to be retested or so forth and we broken down clarification on that i'm not sure i saw that in the rules would be helpful hope that's helpful thank you very much thanks robert bobby Hello, thanks for taking my comment. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Bobby Berg. I am one of the proprietors of Formulation Station, uh, under which I produce my edible line, Houghton Hetty. Uh, I have some various serious concerns with these proposed rule changes, uh, particularly 2.24, as you, you know, may imagine. Um, yeah, my concerns are innumerable. I'm not really sure where to start, so I apologize if this gets a little disconjointed. Uh, I do want to start with applauding the decision to defer for a few weeks. I think that's going to go a long way in, uh, you know, restoring some public faith here. Um, basically, if we want this industry to thrive, uh, we really need to nurture small craft producers with niche and unique product offerings, not chop them off at the knees before they can even hit stride. Um, these proposed changes would have an immense impact on innovative products. Uh, I myself make a couple. I know I have a bunch of peers that are also hoping to make, uh, you know, great products. We've got Martha out there with uh, Fog Valley Farm who makes really wonderful frozen cookie dough. Her entire business would go belly up if this goes through. Um, you know, sorry, let me pull up my notes. Uh, basically, imagine telling the Alchemist or Hill Farmstead that they can't make IPAs because they should be refrigerated or should be consumed rather quickly. Uh, Vermont would not only lose millions in annual tax revenue, we would have a fraction of the credibility on the global beer stage uh, that we do now. And as you know, we are global leaders and we are situated to, uh, you know, take up that same mantle with the edible industry. And that's not going to happen if we push through these changes. I understand that uh, understaffing is one of the major issues uh, pushing this, and I want to, you know, be understanding of that fact, but I don't think that it should lead to, you know, completely eliminating market segments and stifling innovation. Uh, I will provide some further written comment at some point, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, I guess I'll finish off with saying you certainly won't transition any legacy operators if this goes through in the edible world. I know if this had been on the agenda initially, there's, I'd still be out there trapping, uh, throwing massive, you know, market parties and, you know, running it up with high dose, uh, <laughs> freshly baked goods. 
uh, you know, we already have one of the most restrictive edible guidelines in the country, and it's really not going to encourage customers or operators from the other side of the tracks to, so to speak, to uh, come on over. So thanks. Sorry to ramble. Have a good day. Thanks, Bobby. Amelia. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, so first of all, I just wanted to give you guys some acknowledgement and thanks for um, your work on H270. Um, from my point of view, specifically the medical portions, uh, I know that a lot of people might not know how hard it is to get medical legislation through, um, specifically progressive reform, uh, but it is a pain in the butt um, and there's a lot of compromise involved. And so I just want to thank you for your work there. Um, a little <laughs> confused and frustrated on how we got sampling for the sake of competition before we got sampling approved for registered medical patients, um, especially when we're looking at allowing double the employee allowance of flour to be given to a non-registered patient or a non-registered employee as a competition entry for consumption. Um, some of these judges aren't even from Vermont and are not, <laughs> are not registered in any system, um, but a registered patient still can't walk into a dispensary and walk out with a free pre-roll. Uh, I don't care about competitions. I like I don't. I think that it's cool if we have a structure in place for a competition to exist. Um, but I do think that providing accessible, affordable slash free product to patients should be as much of a priority as making sure competitions can happen. Um, so moving forward, I really hope that there is some sort of priority in making sure that patients have free sampling. Um, I understand that there is a structure in place where retailers can sell whatever product they want at whatever price that they set. Wholesalers and, and cultivators and manufacturers can do the same, but it is not the same as a patient being able to walk into a store and walk out with a free product that will make a significant difference in their day. Um, so yeah, that that's basically just my comment. Um, I think that if we can write out a mechanism for free sampling in a competition setting, then we can also focus on writing out that same kind of mechanism for registered medical patients within a retail setting. Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Dan. Hey, everyone. Um, I don't have the best cell service, so I'm not sure if you guys can hear me, but yeah, I just wanted to chime in on the proposed changes to the social equity. Um, I know there's a lot of folks who were rejected for their social equity applications who felt that they, you know, deserved to have that status. Um, I noticed that you guys had changed the laws. I guess what I would like to say is anybody who was previously rejected, you know, if you were personally harmed through cannabis prohibition, if you were arrested, if you pled guilty to a cannabis crime and felt that you were incarcerated, you know, uh, I think we should all really speak up and make some public comment about this issue. Um, you know, there's just a lot of contradictory uh, statements. The whole intention of social equity and cannabis is to give back to a community that was harmed by cannabis prohibition. And um, I feel these new regulations are, you know, specified to basically prevent certain people um, from qualifying based on new kind of arbitrary guidelines. So I just wanted to let everyone know in the community, if you were rejected for social equity, um, you know, it's a good time now to kind of speak out about what you feel you're entitled to for the harm that you've gone through um, for being busted, convicted, um, or anything you've been through uh, with Canvas Prohibition. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Dave. Uh, thanks, Nellie. Can I uh, yield to Martha and come back, <clears throat> come back after her, please? Uh, I, yeah, Martha. Thanks, there. Dave. Um, hi, I'm Martha. I own Fog Valley Farm. And as Bobby said, um, I make frozen cookie doughs. My entire product line at the moment is frozen. And so the amendment to rule 2.24 would be incredibly detrimental to my business. Um, so I just want to not only speak to Bobby's comments that he made, I fully support everything he said. I'm not going to reiterate it because he said it very eloquently, but 
we are also food professionals. We know how to handle food in a safe manner. And also in the rules stated right now, we currently have to follow all health food safety guidelines put out by the Department of Health. And we all do that in our kitchens. And they're not super complicated to regulate and inspect. I feel I could go into a kitchen and inspect kitchens. It's really not that complicated. There are guidelines and checklists out there for inspectors. Um, and I also, again, we're food safety professionals. I just finished completing a food safety course in order to keep my kitchen safe. That's something I felt was important to me to fully understand the guidelines. And so I just wanna make it known to the board that we are not just random people out here mixing up whatever in our kitchens. We know how to handle food and how to handle them safely. And I think the guidelines are in place to keep food safe and protect consumers. Thank you guys. Thanks, Martha. Dave. Thanks. You know, nev you never want to step on your client's toes. Uh, Martha said it really well. Um, one, I want to ask that um, the changes that you showed on the screen, if those could be made available uh, as a document, um, uh, you know, it, Gabe, if you can email that to me, that would be fine. Or if you could get it up on, on the web, that would be fine as well. I have to think we'll, we'll publish them on the web so that everybody can see them. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add on on, on rule 2.2.4, which is something that some of us in the industry found out about through the rumor mill, uh, but I believe this is the first time it uh, was shown publicly. Um, there's a lot of problem there. I, I get the meat and dairy uh, one is your hands are tied there. Uh, you know, there's some, uh, you know, some, some federal state uh, law intertwining there uh, that, you know, makes dairy a big no-no, uh, meat a big no-no, fine, uh, you know, you can't control it. This time and temperature control, as well as the, the section on, on supplements, as you've heard, it, this is a real blow to the industry if this goes through. Um, you know, there are a lot of great products just starting to come onto the market, uh, being put together by folks uh, with experience in the sort of herbalism world um, that you are going to be shutting out. Um, and I don't really see why. Uh, you know, look, I'm not a fan of mixing THC with melatonin uh, or THC and CBN and melatonin, I, you know, but there's nothing particularly dangerous about it. Um, and, you know, sleep gummies are sleep gummies. And, you know, just because melatonin is marketed as a sleep aid doesn't change the fact that, you know, CBN's a sleep aid too. Um, and so, you know, rather than banning these products, uh, you have rules on labeling and making statements about curative effects that you can just continue to enforce. You don't need to ban ingredients that are safe for consumption because some other products containing those ingredients that don't contain cannabis may make claims as to curative effects. And that doesn't help the industry and it doesn't help consumers. Um, with time and time control, there's a lot of products that, you know, there's time, I mean, like all the gummies have expiration dates. This is just, <laughs> retailers have refrigerators. We can log the temperatures of those refrigerators pursuant to a rule that you prescribe, telling us how often and what temperatures. There are better ways of doing this than to shut out entire segments of this industry. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Uh, very disappointed also just in, in the manner in which this was proposed, um, the manner in which this was proposed sort of on, on the fly late and, uh, and not well publicly disclosed. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next we have uh, Grow, uh, Grow by MJ Cultivators, I think. Yep, that's me, Marie. Um, I'm just kind of 
curious if there is a way. Uh, first of all, Dave, if you can get that info up on, or not Dave, I'm sorry. Um, as David mentioned, if we could get that info up online, uh, that would be awesome because I couldn't get a good view of that myself. Um, what, what I do have is a question um, that I will put as a comment, I guess. Um, I would like to know how we can go about finding out who our licensing agent is specifically to deal with. I'm a manufacturing tier two right now. I am considering switching my license type and I don't see anything as to how to go about doing that. And I would like to talk to somebody directly, you know, in the privacy of a conversation, you know, not here on this forum, but to discuss that more, uh, you know, in depth. So that's just something I don't know if somebody could make a point of reaching out to me, letting me know how to find out who to contact. That'd be great. I don't know if it goes by a license type or geographical location. So that's it. Thank you. Tito. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Uh, so I just want to say I agree with Bobby and Amelia and Dave, and um, I really hope we can just we can keep figuring out how things can get done and not uh, not eliminating whole categories of products and to not take the fun out of Vermont's potential. I mean, we could really we could really be a, the, like the number one global destination for cannabis, um, but not if we keep taking the fun out of it. So that's all. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, Tito. Jeffrey. Good afternoon, board. Hope everyone's having a good day. Um, just a couple quick things. I want to express gratitude to the agency for deciding to postpone uh, their final vote on the proposed rules changes. Uh, I thought that was an excellent move. Thank you. Um, affording the industry another month uh, for this step in the process, recognizing there's multiple steps still, uh, I think was vital. So good move. Um, <clears throat> lastly, I just want to express support uh, for uh, 224. Um, I, I would just like to impart on the board. Um, DGA has confidence that uh, you will be able to find a solution here. Oregon State allows for temp temperature sensitive products. Washington State allows for te temperature sensitive products. California has ice cream, okay? New York State with their rules that are rolling out, um, they allow for this as well. There is no reason why Vermont, home of Ben and Jerry and everybody, right, uh, cannot figure this out as well. We have confidence that this agency can. Clearly, uh, it is what the industry is asking you to do. Um, that's it. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I just want to recognize that James, you're down at Canara, have an excellent time. Uh, the National Craft Cannabis uh, Coalition is down there. Vermont Growers Association is a part of that organization, and we hope uh, some productive conversations ensue. Everyone, have a good day. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, anyone else who join via phone, feel free to raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a public comment. Um, and um, if you join via phone, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself if you'd like to make a comment. And we'll just jump over to, what is it, Bernardo? Yep, Bernardo. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you guys for uh, H270. I know it's some steps forward. Uh, the ag insertion there had some direct impacts on my licensing. Um, and I appreciate you considering and putting forward that um, language. Um, today, I just want to bring up, uh, I'm just curious about the difference in the variances between flour and uh, manufactured uh, vaping products and uh, why, why it's 10% for oil, but 20% uh, for flour. Um, I feel like I'm more likely to find like a purple unicorn than a 36% flower strain, but a 72% oil is, you know, it's like, it's prohibitive still, right? It's, uh, 
if the board has the ability to create a variance and has the ability to create that discrepancy themselves, I just, you know, would like you to consider increasing that variance from 10% to 20% for oil as well. Um, you know, a 30% cap on THC is more like an 85 or 90% cap on oil, um, not a 60%. So it's just, um, I know the board's trying and, and, you know, this is going to be a good time moving forward to try and work on the governor and trying to change the THC caps or eliminate them. But if the board does have the ability to consider that and make that change, I just want to make that recommendation, please. Thank you. Thanks, Bernardo. Scott. Hi, yeah, I was just hoping that maybe just quickly you could uh, repeat the date in uh, August that you have your meeting and when the submission time is. Just... We'll get those dates up on the website after the uh, meeting is over for the rest of 2023. Okay, thank you. It was, uh, July 19th is when we postpone action on these amendments though, right? July 19th? Yep. Yep. We do have a phone that is unmuted. So um, phone number ending in, um, hang on one second, sorry, 9192, you are unmuted. Hi, this is Chelsea from Moonrise Botanicals and Moonrise Alchemy. Um, so I just wanted to comment on what was stated about including other verbal um, additions to cannabis products. So I know melatonin was specifically mentioned. I'm curious if this applies to other herbs in general and how to get more information about that because I'm about to enter the market and this is very important to me in terms of what I'm trying to do um, to understand like if any other herb is being used, it could be claimed to have a curative effect potentially um, and how to just delineate between the substances and yeah, just to get a clear understanding on that feels really important. Okay, thanks, Chelsea. We will discuss that in our comments or when we review the substance of the rule. Um, any anyone else who joined via phone or via link? Um, we will have one more public comment period after this. Um, for general comments, but anyone else who would like to uh, make a comment about these proposed rule amendments before the board starts discussing them? I'm not seeing anybody, Pepper. Okay. Then I'll close the public comment window. Um, thanks for all those comments. Um, and I think uh, I was taking some notes while Gabe was going through, and I think we should just start with rule one uh, at the beginning. So I think we'll address a lot of the comments that were just made um, about particularly rule two point, was it 2.2.4, um, as well as some of the other ones. So um, Gabe, I don't know if it's worth pulling up the rule again. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that um, as I, as I put it up, I should emphasize, we're going to reopen uh, the opportunity to file written comments. In fact, we never really closed it, but if folks could have comments in by say July 10, we'd be able to guarantee those comments got in the package. So, um, and those can be sent to ccp.info at vermont.gov. We'll post that online as well. Let's see if I can get your um, or two. Can we start with rule one? Is that right? Of course. Uh, let me know the section. I'd be happy to uh, jump into it. My first comment was around 1.1.4. 1. 1. Um, I don't know if anyone had anything before that. Nope. Nope. So, um, just this, I know we kind of said the applicability of this rule 
and just correct me if I'm wrong. I know we changed it to persons who engage in transfer sale of hemp derived products that contain more than 1.5 milligrams of THC per serving. Um, I guess my comment or my question is, A, do we have to say Delta 9 THC? And then B, um, do we have to uh, include the 1 to 20 ratio? I had a similar concern to yours about whether or not B should be a little bit more generic and make sure that, you know, I think the emergency rule set or what used to be the emergency rule can speak to that, but we ought to be clear that um, the 1.5 is not the limit of the board's jurisdiction. Okay. And and then the, the ratio, like I know that, I mean, it's my intention and in that we don't get into the uh, kind of realm of um, adding all of our requirements to what truly are what we consider non-intoxicating products. I think the, the, the role of the board is hey, over you are as well. in, intoxicating products. Um, and so I wonder if we need to add kind of the rest of the emergency rule into this section about the applicability of, of these rules. I guess I, help me procedurally. What you mean as a reference that we would reference the two point one seven, or that we would add the whole piece here? Well, I'm just saying. Because the rest like, of the emergency rule is in two point one seven, right? Well, I mean, so let me just. So the this is this is pertaining to the applicability of our of the the entirety of rule one, right? This this one point one point four. That's accurate. Yeah. And so, if someone is is producing a hemp derived product that's full spectrum, that's one to twenty, um, does that mean that they have to comply with all of rule one? Only if rule, I, as my my understanding, only if rule one would require that they be licensed. So. Um, I don't think the the broadened applicability of the rule doesn't change anything in my understanding about who out there in the world is obligated to have a license from the board before engaging in um, uh, a business, if that makes any sense. Okay, it does make sense. I just wanted to be clear in my mind that, you know, if I make a, if I use, you know, hemp to make a full spectrum tincture that's, mm -hmm. you know, we consider non intoxicating that this that these rules. Don't require licensure with the board. That would be my understanding as well. The only time that somebody um, making an they would only people making intoxicating products that they would want to market through the adult use uh, system. Would, okay. would be required to obtain a license, but that was sort of the requirement. Okay. And is that the feeling of Julie and Kyle? Do you feel the same way about just uh, people that are making full spectrum tinctures using hemp as their source material that meet the one to 20 ratio? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, my next comment was on 1.4.5. Does anyone have anything before that? Nope. Nope. So, uh, you know, I, I've been talking for a while now about just removing the cessation of operations escrow. And it, so, okay, I guess, the, and I was, I guess I was looking at it earlier. So this does that. The, this this just removes the requirement for cessation of operation escrow accounts. Yes. Okay, great. I, I was uh, following along on a different version, I guess. Um, okay, great. Um, next on my list is, and maybe this is, if you could just go to 1.9 also, unless there's I a- I have uh, something for 1.4.9, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay. Just 
two things that we've received public comment on that we could consider. I'm not necessarily advocating or not for one of these two things that came up that could go here. One is we received comment about uh, the signing of a labor peace agreement being one of these options in 2.4.9. And then the other is, um, and we received multiple comments from the Vermont Medical Society on this is a plan to make or sell low THC products is another item that could go here if we if that's something we would like to consider. Um, I guess let me and take again, the second one. Are options. Yeah, let me take this. <laughs> let me take the second one first because anytime you add to this, it you know it means that like it's easier to satisfy or there, there's more options for people, which might not be a bad thing, but it, it kind of like will move people away from the things that we thought were important the first go around. I mean, I don't like, do we, so it would be a, a, a plan to create low THC products? Yeah, make and sell. Make and sell, or and do they? Offer access to, so in my mind, if you're a manufacturer, that means making them, and it, or, or if you're a cultivator, it means growing low THC uh cannabis and if you're a retailer that means selling them okay and do they have a definition of what low thc means they do it was um based on milli well so this came their suggestion came from um connecticut and i think it's 1.5 to 2 milligrams is what they consider low thc in connecticut i agree with you that the more we add to this the more sort of watered down it potentially becomes but it also um you know, some of the options here are like, for example, making a plan to pay livable wage. So once somebody does that, they've, they've checked off the list. If we want to provide more options for people to access additional options in the future, that might be one reason to add to it. Um, again, throwing it out there is something that we heard. Okay. Um, I. <laughs> I, I don't know, like the way I feel about it is kind of like, you know, that that's trying to have kind of a heavy hand in in just market forces. Like if, if someone has a plan to sell these things and they just are not viable on the market, um, you know, or alternatively, if, you know, it turns out that, you know, Vermonters really want low THC products, it's kind of like, well, the market will supply them. They'll find, you know, I, I don't know if, we want to dilute this section by trying to just dictate from our chairs in Montpelier what the market wants. Um, that that's so just I, my feeling on that. I like I'm raising it because it for an effort of transparency, right? So we're why well, don't think we have to decide today? Okay. So this is taking language from Connecticut, and they say, uh, "Remind me, uh, best you know." Your level best, like uh, make your best attempt to sell low. To it just provide sounds access to low THC, or I think their language goes on to say or high CBD products. Okay, I don't really have a. I I, I raise it today for consideration. That's all. <laughs> I feel okay. like that's kind of hard to evaluate as far as a plan for positive impact criteria, just because that's I don't, how can we determine that somebody gave it their best attempt to sell these? Well, that's that's true of a lot of these, to be honest. Fair enough. Um, and what was the other one? Um, signing a labor peace agreement. Can you remind me what that is? It's essentially a, a organization signs an agreement that says they will take a neutral approach to union organization that will neither, uh, you know, promote it or or prevent it. Huh. And we don't have that as I mean, I thought it was already illegal to interrupt um, union negotiations. You I think what you're thinking of is more like uh, union busting, and that's true. Um, I think that there are folks who believe that the signing of a labor peace agreement um, makes that employer more labor friendly and neutral towards, you know, any union activity that might occur. Okay. 
there be any need to talk to the Department of Labor about that? I would guess they don't want to talk. No, I don't think the Department of Labor would want to. I, I'm assuming the Department of Labor would not want to lay. It's not something that they would weigh in on. I don't think. I mean, I, I think uh, an operator would want to talk to their attorney, their their counsel, right. if they have counsel before doing that. But and what all the implications of that might be. But again, raising it for consideration only. Okay. I think um, I just would want to just dig into that a little bit um, more before we decide to add that in. I agree. All right. Um, anything before 1.9? Not for me. Nope. Okay. Um, yeah, again, I was just looking at, I think, an earlier version. So I think uh, that's fine with me. Um, I was I was looking at sub E there. That was all I had for rule one. Is there anything anyone wants to, any other parts of rule one? No, I think the crux of conversation will, will occur in rule two. <laughs> at least for me. I think we're good. Okay. So my first was on 2.2.4. Is there anything before that? Not from not nope. for me. Nope. So Gabe, can you remind me? Um, you know, I think we heard a couple comments that um the some of this was was new that they're only that most people are seeing it um, kind of late in the game. And I know you, you know you weren't our general counsel when this <laughs> when this original amendment was sent to ICAR approved and sent to ICAR. But do you um, have or maybe Bryn have a sense of kind of the, a response to that? As in, yeah. like when when did some of this show up? And and is it is it new? Did people have appropriate um, ability to comment? Um, thank you. I um, I guess there's always that paradox where if you receive information and comment and then make a change in response to that, as one would probably hope you would, you've then created something new that other people might not have notice of. And that is one of the reasons I think it'd be really wise to kick this over for a month so that people can digest and comment on things they might not have seen to this point. The original filing with the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules did contain a blanket prohibition on meat and dairy. Um, and then we received feedback from some of our uh, stakeholders with experience in food safety regulation um, to the effect that you know a little bit more nuance might be called for, especially with regard to water activity and pH, significant factors used in that world to determine um, whether something is kind of shelf stable and safe. Um, similarly, the idea that the definition of dairy product already exists and ought to be embraced uh, was a late act that came in late. Um, similarly, the uh, the recommendation that uh, refrigerated products or temperature controlled products um, really aren't within our ability to oversee um, was really an expansion of that idea about meat and dairy. So um, it is accurate that this section has changed significantly. Uh, there was, however, an original plan published to restrict meat and dairy. It's really just a question of the vehicles by way of the degree of nuance in which um, you might want to do it. But I think folks saying a lot of this is new have a point, and that's why it makes a lot of sense to uh, open comment on it and kick it to next month to make sure that folks who are seeing this new have some time. Okay. And uh, how do Julie and Kyle, how do we feel about meat and dairy? I mean, I've got my opinion about it, um, which I'm happy well, to start it, with. Yeah, go for well, it. I mean, I think that there's a difference between high risk and low risk 
um, foods. I'm not sure if there's a little bit of perhaps confusion as to what we're trying to do here um, and what would be considered a high risk food and what would be considered a, a low risk food. I think there's some that are easy um, to figure out what we're trying to accomplish and others you know, would fall into that low risk category. Um, but, but why don't you start, Pepper? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so I think, uh, I think getting, um, kind of having a prohibition on these types of potentially hazardous foods, which, you know, have strict temperature controls and, um, you know, we have all these kind of very specific rules around homogenization and, um, you know, safe handling. You know, I I know that some commenters pointed us to other states that that allow ice creams and, and raw cookie dough and things like that. I've got some real concerns about um, those products, given that um, we do not have the support of kind of our traditional state agencies that inspect commercial kitchens. Um, you know, I'm I am down here at Canra I and mean, we just got a little bit of an overview of some of the other states and the size of their compliance staff. Um, you know, I was just Oklahoma grew to 170 people, you know, like, it, it, you know, that's a relatively new board, you, you know, these agencies are in the realm of hundreds of people. Um, we, of course, have, I think, eight compliance agents that have to be um, experts in every aspect of the supply chain. And I just don't think that we in kind of with less than one year under our belts of, of adult use sales are ready to kind of just, you know, go down the path of allowing every type of product um, that people can come up with. You know, our manufacturing tiers are tailored towards the types of extraction methods that people can use. They're not tailored towards um, the types of products that people can create and the kind of accompanying regulations that should go along with the creation of those products. And I think maybe that's a direction that we could move in, um, but I don't feel comfortable short, you know, absent where we stand today that we can ensure that every single one of our manufacturing facilities is capable of meeting the very rigorous regulations that the Department of Health has with respect to, you know, proper storage, handling, temperature controls, and all the other issues um, that kind of commercial kitchens deal with. Um, you know, we do have a very expert, you know, veteran from the Department of Health, public health, former public health inspection manager on our staff. Um, and I think that we can get there, uh, especially with the support potentially across training from the Department of Health. But I think that with respect to, you know, meat and dairy, um, and we should say that this is kind of like uncooked meat, uncooked dairy products that I, I feel comfortable with that portion of 2.2.4. Yeah, I mean, just very generally, I mean, I, I generally agree. I think I'm a little concerned that people put or perceived to put food safety in the back seat in the name of creativity. I think we even heard from a commentator that food safety expertise is really not that big of a deal. It's not that hard. It's easy to do. And I think that that undermines, you know, a lot of how food safety experts keep um, us safe from foodborne illnesses, not just in the cannabis space, but across, you know, where and how we purchase food products. You know, it's important to remember that, you know, a lot of these products would need um, sell by dates that would be evaluated by a food safety expert. Um, non cannabis food manufacturers are required to have products evaluated by third party food processing authorities. Those are often across state lines. We can't ship products across state lines. So, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to be FDA here in the Department of Health. And I know that frustrates some people. Um, you know, it's not our intent to stifle creativity, but you know, one major foodborne illness outbreak from the cannabis space reflects poorly on all of us. I think there's a lot of good actors that we've heard from today that would take every step, you know, but checklists and guidelines are checklists and guidelines. Um, nothing more, nothing less. And it only takes one bad actor. Um, you know, an ice cream and take and bake stuff probably could be, you know, appealing to children. 
you know, I think that's a forgotten separate issue. Um, and a lot of this, I mean, I know that's a general statement that I just made and I'm not trying to um, rile people back up with that statement. Um, but I think, you know, given the support and how we're off on an island, um, I don't see it as a um, unwise step to kind of take this approach now, considering, um, you know, the support that we need in order to feel comfortable here. Agreed. I, I, so this has been a concern of mine for a while. This is what my formal or partially what my formal education is in. Um, and the meat and dairy products are definitely a concern. I think I need to think more about the pH and water activity and what that actually looks like. But um, the, you know, the safe handling of food products, to your point, um, it can be incredibly dangerous. And it, it you know, it uh, there are checklists and there are guidelines, but there's someone that is part of a state agency that is a third party that oversees making sure that those checklists and guidelines are followed and we don't have the resources to do that. Yeah, when we talk about, you know, high risk products, we're talking about obviously ice cream, pie cakes that require refrigeration, cheesecakes, you know, butter, cheese, yogurt. You know, I think it's important um, to point out that what we're not talking about is breads, cookies, muffins, cakes, cooked fruit pies, fruit jam and jellies, confections and sweets, dry herbs, herb mixtures, dip and soup mixes, popcorn, granola, chocolate covered pretzels, marshmallows, graham crackers, cereal bars. I don't want folks to get the wrong, and that list is not exhaustive. I think, you know, and even, you know, with additional processing, salad dressings, beverages like kombucha, tea and apple cider, barbecue sauces, hot sauces, ketchups, mustards, those could all find a path into the marketplace. And these, again, these lists are not exhaustive, but I, I want folks to understand um, you know, that this isn't a, in a, in a, an existential threat on the entire edible market. It's just high risk ones where we don't have the expertise to, um, you know, in, in agency to, to really feel comfortable putting our stamp of approval on these products. And it's not things that are refrigerated for particular taste. Sure. Right. So like some chocolate. About, right. But like to the point about beer, not all beers, they don't have to necessarily be refrigerated. Right. Um, I had one question about the meat and dairy that I think is probably important to talk about. Um, does dairy include plant-based milk if it's a substitute for milk? Um, so I would have to. <laughs> we've, because we've gone and attached ourselves to the Title VI definition, I suspect not. However, because of the parameters around water activity and yeah. pH, it's quite probable that those would be problematic anyway. Okay. Because at room temperature, flora could yep. proliferate and yep. proliferate. And... Thank you. Um, and then I guess the other piece of this is about the nutritional supplement drug product additive. I mean, what we're saying is that this is this is an area where there's just so little science here like uh you know i just we don't know what these interactions are going, going to be um it's tough for us to kind of put a stamp of approval that something is safe uh you know if we just don't if we do, i mean we just can't say that it's it's safe is, is that kind of the the rationale here um and it seems like a decent rationale to me it is according to my understanding from the commentary I've received from the people that I've spoken with in trying to develop this. Um, the concerns are several. One is that that these products in particular are provocative of federal intervention in a way that others aren't. Um, another is the the appearance of the state through the registration system, uh, the appearance that the state has evaluated these things for for safety by dint of registering them. Um, I think there's inferences made by consumers that the state does certain things before it um, endorses for sale a particular product, and we don't have the capacity to evaluate potential drug interactions of, um, of cannabis products and other drugs and supplements. Um, and so although you know anybody can take with one hand the supplement that was found and uh, take with the other hand the cannabis product, something different for the government to say this is endorsed as a combination product 
um, and also a lot of concern that really the one and only reason that those products would be combined would be to imply a curative effect. And there's a statutory prohibition on exactly that um, suggestion as, as a marketing matter. So um, for all those reasons, there's there's a lot of downside risk to that particular kind of product, I think, um, all the way from provoking unwanted federal uh, uh, federal intervention to simple consumer uh, yeah. the degree of safety that, and analysis that has gone into the product. Thank you. Yeah. FDA has said as much, correct? Yes, they have. To, to a degree, yes, they have. <laughs> okay. Um, and then how about subsection M? I, I mean, I like where this is headed. I personally don't want to see, just given the risks of being a tier three manufacturer, I don't think I, and frankly, maybe this is my own like limitation. I did not expect any tier three manufacturer to be in a, a building, um, a, that was not subject to the commercial building codes. I mean, we're talking about um, highly explosive uh, solvents um, that people are allowed to use. And you think about the the building codes around, I mean, you go to any tier three manufacturer, you see how in depth their operations are. Um, it, it never dawned on me that we would see a tier three manufacturer at a, homestead a non-public building um and i just want to make sure that this goes the full gamut of saying that um you know all of the kind of commercial building codes that would be applicable to a tier three manufacturer in a commercial building would be applicable to one that's based out of a home yeah agreed yeah you want to do a hydrocarbon extraction in your garage i want to see a fire safety stamp of approval there yeah I agree. One of the reasons why we talked about the tier one manufacturing was because we assumed that that is the type of manufacturer that would be in someone's home, not not a tier three. I agree. So I I don't know, like, does Gabe, I don't know if this gets there and I don't want to put, you know, if we would just want to say like a tier three manufacturer can't be home based, you know, that's fine. What I don't want to say is, you know, you need a certificate of occupancy from fire safety in order to be a tier three manufacturer out of your home because they're just not going to go to someone's home. You know, they, they have, they'll just, they don't have the jurisdiction. So that's just like, I, I just feel like, do, do you think this does it or do you think uh, um, we should just be more explicit? We could be more explicit in rule one and just say in the section concerning tier three manufacturers and what that license does, no hydrocarbon extraction. That, that's very possible if you think this is too are we certain that that's correct? Well, I guess it's because there are other businesses that operate out of folks' homes. Those are all open to the public, though, typically, right? There are a section of someone's home that is open to the public. If it, um, there are a hairdresser or a yeah. like snowflake shop, you know, like those places. If somebody were to do that, so open the place up mm -hmm. for the general public to come and go, right? Or if somebody were to employ more than two people, mm -hmm. they become, by dint of doing that, a public building under DFS jurisdiction. Um, so all of those, you know, the home uh, hair cutter, yep. uh, DFS does have and can assert jurisdiction over that. Um, where everybody's nervous, the place they can't well, because it's yeah. not open. Yep. Job. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, I can make a note to consider making a corresponding amendment to not to Title One or to Section or Rule One, I should say. Um, if you think that might be more clear, I, I think you should and have that that one be the one that's published because, you know, we can always make it we can always take it out if we get the comments that, you know, this is a bad, you know, there's other ways to do it, but I'd rather people have the ability to see it, um, you know, for what for what we publish uh, between now and, you know, July 19th. Anything else on 2.2.4? No, I mean, I, I, you know, I get how in the, the Secretary of State filing is like a, a moment in time. And we have, you know, based on commentary from a host of different folks, have, mm -hmm. have worked to make that more specific. 
I get how that makes it sound or feel to folks like this kind of caught them off guard. And I think, you know, providing another until July 10th, I think is what you said, gave an opportunity to come and um, provide us, you know, quantitative information. I, 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 I want to be clear that, you know, we understand where people want to go, but we need to see, you know, the reasoning to go certain places, um, get us that feedback and we'll look to reconsider that. I know that this is a, a big part of the rule update. So I just wanted to say, you know, get us that information and we'll look to see how the uh, dynamics have changed at the end of July. Okay. Um, can we go to, unless someone has something beforehand, 2.2.10. So um, on the health warning, um, really, um, you know, my concerns around changing the health warning are purely procedural, I should say, um, which really are, um, you know, I, I should clarify that, you know, I don't think that there's any science to suggest that one kind of series of statements about the health impacts of cannabis um, is significantly better or worse with respect to kind of public health outcomes than any other kind of grouping of statements around this. But um, I do am particularly concerned about um, just how many times it says in law that we were required to collaborate with the Department of Health on this warning. Um, and I know that at least the last time I asked, um, they have not had an opportunity to provide feedback on this warrant, or they, I, they've had the opportunity, they have not provided feedback on this. May warrant. I interrupt, Mr. Chair? I mean, I, I we, uh, we have a whole almost month to continue to collaborate with the Department of Health now that we have kicked this to our next meeting. Um, there is one uh, edit here that was unintentional and that the individuals of 20 or one years of age was taken out. That was unintentional, so we'll need to add that. Probably should be first. Um, but we, we have the opportunity to continue to attempt to collaborate between now and the time that we actually would vote on this. So I just wanted to to remind you of that and throw that out there as we had this conversation. Okay. And um, I would say just also that I think, um, Julie, if I'm correct, that the motivation behind this change is to um, try and adopt uh, a more standard uh, label as kind of using the ASTM guidance? Correct. So the ASTM um, has a collaboration with CANRA, as you know, um, and this is essentially taken from their, their final standards. Okay. So I looked at that document and even, I agree that this moves in that direction, but there's still things in there in their guidance that are not in this. And the, I really don't want to be in a position of changing this again, um, you know, because there's, you know, as we heard, there's a transition cost and then there's a, a runway um, where we allow, when there's two warning labels out there. And I don't want to get to the position where there might be three or four. Um, and so, um, you know, there's there's a few things in the ASTM guidance that I don't see in here. And I'm wondering if they needed to be added in here. You know, as we continue to collaborate with the with the VDH, we can certainly have that conversation with them. OK. I know uh, one that stuck out to me was a like a terpene warning. We don't require terpene testing. So that, for example, would not apply to the state of Vermont. Well, the, the two that I saw in particular, which they said um, they're pretty specific about, and I know that they have kind of in their preamble that you need to have this or something substantially similar. Um, mm -hmm. But they say um, that you're supposed to say um, consume at your own risk, which I think, um, you know, whether we agree with that 
or not is in the ASTM standard. And then also do not consume during pregnancy or while breastfeeding. And I know that we have something that there may be um, may be harmful, especially if, but it's not an explicit uh, statement saying do not do these, these things. And again, I don't really care about what the warning says um, in particular. I just think that if we if the goal is to move to an ASTM standard, um, we should just do the full ASTM standard so that we don't have to change it again. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Between uh, the time that we originally published this and now, they have published their final standards. So the first one we had access to as a draft through CANRA. They have published the final standard since then with exactly those types of tweaks. So instead of saying, I've forgotten what the original phrasing was, it said consume at your own risk instead of, you know, something else. It was, it was, uh, there were wording changes. But yeah, I couldn't agree more with just adopting that standard makes the most sense. Other states are looking at that. It's a, in some places, a voluntary standard. In some places, they're considering adopting it be a rule. The more states that come online, the more standards are going to be necessary for this type of thing. And then um, is there any, um, I mean, in this, this kind of takes things in a, in a slightly different direction. Is there any... <laughs> uh utility in us just using wholesale one of our neighboring states are just trying to work with our um kind of fellow regulators in new england to just create one standard uh new england label just because you know it seems to me like descheduling or rescheduling cannabis is it you know is a 10-year process um however we may see um, interstate commerce much quicker, much more quickly. And it seems to me like, uh, the, like having a unique label, you know, might be an impediment to interstate commerce. So I would, I don't know about New England. I think labels are more about the consumer than they are about the business, quite frankly. So I think what we would be looking for is uniformity among many states because the consumer may travel from I don't know, South Carolina, South Dakota, California to Vermont. Um, I think that's why CANRA is collaborating with the ASTM, but we can certainly look at either of those options. I I just mean like I think the the most the path of least resistance for interstate commerce, if a judge all of a sudden, you know, a federal judge or someone um just decides, hey, listen, the dormant commerce clause applies to this, um, but we should allow it for states that are abutting that are legal states um, that we would want to make sure that we have some sort of standard for at least New York and Massachusetts um, for kind of our, so, our. If I recall, I think New York is looking at the, at least the symbol. I don't recall if they're looking at the same warning. Have to go look. But um, again, I think that the label is more about the consumer than the than the product moving from state to state. So if you go from if you go across the country, maybe products can't go across the country, but individuals certainly can, and they will purchase products in different states. And therefore, the the warning being similar across states is why you would want that uniformity. So I, I just yeah. want to be clear. Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead. No, no, no. I, I, said, I mean, yeah. I just want to be clear on where we are because this is more from a process conversation and a collaborative or consulting or whatever the language is in 164, and we have not received any anything from the health department with repeated um, from many different people in our office, you know, asking for to get their eyes on this to, uh, hey, should we wait to do this at all until we talk to other states, whether it's in our region or, or things kind of move in a certain direction with many different states, whether it's in New England or, or not. So I just wanna know and I just want to make sure I'm keeping track of where we are and what what we're what we're attempting to convey to each other here because I'm getting a little lost. Right. And I to to that point, I think procedurally this has been sitting out there since November. So I just want to be conscious of the fact that this is what we warned the public that six, eight months ago, um, without any other com like we the only comment we've received on it really is please give us a run out for this label, right? Yes. Um, Other than getting comment actually from the ASTM saying this is great, we want you to use this. 
So the um, I just want to point out procedurally, yeah. in case it informs anybody's yeah. judgment of how fast to push, I think there's sort of this perception that all rule updates have to be top to bottom rule updates, and that we're going to have to we have to wait a long time. It is quite possible if um, you know there's a desire to move fast on the rule or on the labeling once it's settled. If we want to reconcile things either with the full ASTM boat yeah. or with the Department of Health or with New England neighbors, um, it's quite possible to say, okay, just don't do anything with two two ten today or this update. Nothing prevents you reopening two two ten only. Um, as soon as everybody knows, I do have to say I'm, I get a little nervous for the same reasons the chair is talking about. We're supposed to really have a, a sort of express collaboration with VDH. Um, they were distracted by a small public health event, and <laughs> so I'm forgiving of their um, uh, their uh, narrow bandwidth. But um, I just wanted to point out that it, it's not a forever thing, or it wouldn't mean waiting forever if you were to to choose to defer action on two two ten. And it is a, been a significant um, source of public comment from industry just saying, whatever you do, don't do it twice. Do it twice. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I, I get that, and I'm with Pepper, I'm with you. I'm just trying to figure out where we're all going. <laughs> I honestly didn't think this would be that big of a deal. Uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, we have more time. We have, have, I've had at least one conversation with the Department of Health. We should, we, I have provided them a, a veritable boatload of paper to read. I think we should at least give them time to digest what we've given them and provide us some comments. I think one of those ASTM standards is 85 pages long. You know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't okay. mean to interrupt you, Pepper. I just, I just want to make sure I, I kind of get where we're anticipating going if, um, and maybe we don't know that yet. <laughs> um, with this 2.2.10, as we look to you know, July. Yeah. And, and Julia, like the the only thing I'm talking about having a regional standard, it's not, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm saying if we say that any product sold in Vermont has to have this label, then, um, you know, it, it, it will, it may benefit, I mean, who knows, but it may benefit us to have the exact same la label as the sending states. Um, people that are sending our products or vice versa. If we're trying to send products into New York and they say you have to have our health warning label, you know, it'll benefit us if we already require that by rule. Yeah, so I sit on the or I attend the labeling and packaging subcommittee of Canra and I'd be happy to figure out or ask that group how many of those states are adopting what and where they are. I hadn't thought about it in terms of regionally. I only thought about it in terms of nationally. So we can certainly get more information. Okay. And I looked them up. They're all, I looked up New York, Massachusetts, and Maine, and they're all relatively similar, except um, there's just, you know, unique features of each. And it, it feels like, you know, if we could move over the course of five years or two years or one, you know, however long towards having a unified standard. Uh, I think that would be helpful um, in, you know, in case, you know, a judge decides like, hey, listen, interstate commerce is fine. Um, it's actually unconstitutional not to have interstate commerce. Um, but uh, I think the same to me question applies to the, the, um, the, the symbol, the THC symbol. Is that, I don't, I don't, that's not part of our rule amendment is uh, using the ASTM one, right? Um, I think we got feedback from ASTM on changing the symbol because in the November meeting that we went over these um, initially, uh, Mr. Chair, I think you suggested that we talk to the VDH about the symbol as well as the label. Well, I I did because the ASTM voted on their symbol when our lat when our first when the rules were still open, you know, last March or yep. whenever, and and they. They did not want to do it then, um, just because they had to reopen their process uh, if they were going to try and improve something new. So, yeah, I mean, I think the same would apply to the to the to the label. So, it, I think as you're continue to have discussions with VDH to the extent those discussions actually happen, I, I'd try I'd offer that you put the symbol on the table as well. I think this is a good example of why we ask people. 
not to start printing those that rule label update because <laughs> I didn't anticipate talking about this part of the rule update today but you although know. that happened the first time too we yeah. had several iterations in the in well, the subcommittee that people were or even yeah. like we accidentally took out 21 and and yeah under yeah. right yeah. so um we had two symbols at one point initially we yeah. decided against that yeah best to wait before right. you print anything we should keep going. This we can talk about this in July. Yes. <laughs> um, my next comment was two point two point nineteen. So um under A there, um is this the I can't quite remember in rule four, but I wonder where a failure to notify the board um, on something like this would fall. And I know like all those tiers in rule four, um, they're not, you know, set in stone. You know, we can look at the severity of, of the action and, and the surrounding circumstances, aggravating mitigating circumstances. But is, is this like a, a minor um, violation or would this be a major violation? The rule is written, I think it'd probably be a category two presumptive. I mean, it has potential to jeopardize public health and safety, but may not have yeah. done it. Um, that, but because of the nature of the reporting, it'd be highly, highly context specific. So if yeah. you had a you know, known carcinogen was the contaminant, and that's what adulterated the thing, uh, that would easily be a category one issue. Um, if it were a highly technical failure to report something that bumped up against the action limit, um, but without without any real potential to hurt anybody, you could be in the much less severe categories. Um, like moisture content that's over 13%, up to 15%. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, anything else on this section, anyone? Uh, I had 2.3.9 about the contests. I mean, this, the, I mean, it, the bon bona fide contests for sampling. Is that a, uh, <laughs> is that, is that defined anywhere? I mean, do we care about defining this somewhere? Is this like, is this an area where people could, um, manipulate? Or kind of, is this a loophole that people could exploit? Yes, <laughs> I think um, that part of leaving bona fide undefined would mean that the board would retain discretion to shake its head at things that appear to be, you know, simple efforts to give away cannabis to uh, in, and samples in ways that aren't actually related to a competition. So you might apply common sense questions like, you know, is it advertised anywhere as a competition? Is there a panel of independent judges? That kind of thing. Um, but yes, I, it certainly does open the possibility that somebody would in bad faith say I'm having a competition because they wanted to give samples that wouldn't otherwise be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Obviously, there, obviously, there was a competition in the last couple of months. I'm assuming part of this is a response to how to figure out how to maneuver through that without killing the event, essentially. That's exactly it. And I think the Cannabis Cup came up and everybody said, well, we must have ruled about that. And we did. Yep. Okay. Um, my next one is 2.6.3. Any, anyone have anything before that? I guess I should quickly say that we did hear a comment, I think, on samples for medical patients at we did, recreational yeah. dispensaries. Not sure how I feel about that off the cuff and might require some thought. That feels like something we could potentially address in rule three when we look at that, right? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I'm just bringing it up because I'm trying to remember all the comments we heard. In the and there was commentary that has been passed around suggesting that the employee sample is limit too should, is too low. Well, people have said too high and too low, okay. um, but I remember someone saying it's too low. We compared a little bit behind the scenes to what other states have done, and I think ours is high relatively. I remember writing that portion, and I tried to 
follow what Massachusetts was doing if I think if I think about it correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, just recalling. Yeah, I just wanted to that call too. out those public comments because there have been comments on I think coming down. Yeah, and I, I can appreciate how the medical program samples might be advantageous for certain medical patients at retail establishments. I'm trying to think of a way to address that maybe you know whether it's suggestions to the legislature on the medical program that we'll do with these medical roundtables or updating the medical program itself might mean that that isn't truly a necessary sampling to put out in rule two but I'm just thinking out loud and I'll have some more thoughts on that I guess before July 19th or whatever date that is I just didn't want to forget about that comment I'm uh, Gabe, you could go up a little bit. I was at 2.6.3. So um, if I'm reading B, if I'm reading sub B correctly, yeah, the ones you just highlighted, th these are more lab warning labels that go on sp specific products. Yes. Um, okay. Um, are in Julia, these are from the ASTM. Yes, like I said before, these are from the draft. I think the final had different words, which we can absolutely change to. No problem with that at all. I, I didn't even think that suggestion was an option at that point, this point, so I didn't make it. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to think I mean, about how I feel about the solid concentrate language I mean that cap is there to do what this warning label I feel like is attempting to accomplish and it's kind of what would we rather do have this in here now to show the legislature maybe we'll get public comment on this <laughs> hint hint um if uh if this language is in here now we can tell the legislature hey we've already primed ourselves for that cap to be lifted, right? That's an argument for putting this language in now. The other flip side of it is I don't want to do anything with making solid concentrates harder to sell in this market than they already are because of the cap. And it's an additional warning label necessary. Um, well, again, this was a, a, this is something that came from the ASTM draft and is something similar as in their final, I believe. and. Um, also addresses a comment from the VMS that we've gotten regularly about. Um, I just see it. Yeah, I just see it on from two different perspectives on whether or not. Yeah, it's helpful right now. Right. I, I, I agree. If it's in there, then absolutely. When when we start having a conversation with the legislature about lifting a cap, if we do that again, and we can say, of course, we already are you know, ensuring that the public is understands that these products are more potent. Um, and then there's no delay, right? They don't have to wait for us to write an extra rule. It's already there um, if the legislature chooses to lift the cap. But I agree with you, it can go either way. Do we have a recommended serving size for concentrates? In our... Uh, pamphlet there is a recommended well it's yes there is a suggested way to start with concentrates and i think it's like the tip of a pen okay i know that like colorado blew up a period to like they did yeah like yeah i don't i don't think we nelly would know i don't recall if we did that but we did we did describe what a first dose would look like so I have a feeling that if the cap on solid concentrates gets lifted, that there is going to be a requirement that we develop a either a point of sale flyer or a warning specific to concentrates for concentrate packaging. And so I, I would I would not again just want to have one warning label that people are printing, you know, thousands of times and then have to change it potentially as soon as next year. Um, yeah, I so, mean, that's kind of in the middle of what I was referring to, I, I guess, because that's assuming that the legislature would be comfortable with whatever language is currently in rule. Yeah, I would imagine. Well, I don't know. 
thinking out loud. I have a feeling that they would not be just, you know, <laughs> just in my experience, like, I think that what they're going to want to see is that um, because the effects of consuming a um, high THC solid concentrate may differ from the effects of eating an edible, I think they're going to want to see a specific warning label for high THC solid concentrates, especially because Colorado, which initially allowed high T or still does, but there was a bill to almost get rid of them and it got turned into, we'll make a specific warning label for them. So I think, I think my inclination would be to wait um, for this directive um, so that we don't um, have people print, you know, however many of these and then have to change it. Uh, but we can, you know, happy to continue to receive comment on this and, and see how we feel about this in July. Um, and I feel the same way about the the vape, um, the the vape additional instruction. I mean, agree. Anything, anything more? Anyone want to talk about this anymore? Nope. Julie? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Um, so 2.6.4, I just wanted to read that one more time. Sorry. Um, I think I think that's good. I think it's, you know, and I, I, I was just looking at that part C there. Um, it's almost identical to the language in New Jersey. Um, you know, I, like you said, Gabe, I know that, you know, we've been, there's been conversation about limiting that to 5%, but I think, you know, I think 10% is probably sufficient um, to protect the kind of, um, you know, potential adverse effects that uh, have been noted by some some of the experts in this. But um, yeah, OK. 2.17.1, does anyone have anything before that? Nope. No. So this goes, of course, directly to our hemp tour, and we got a lot of comment about hemp um, derived products during our administrative rules hearings. Um, you know, I think one thing that we've were asked by a number of hemp producers is that, you know, just because something might be intoxicating by a Vermont standard, it's not intoxicating by, you know, a main like Maine or, you know, Texas or something. Um, is there a way that we can still continue to produce these that they're not illegal to produce in Vermont, not illegal to possess, um, but can be shipped out of state? And I don't know how people in the board feel about this. Is that, Gabe, I don't see that like, like a safe harbor provision in this. No, there are, has not been a safe harbor provision added to the draft at this point, but I have heard discussion and suggestions that adding a safe harbor provision similar to what was done in Colorado legislatively um, would be a solution or could be a potential solution for manufacturers who wish to ship out of state and be protected. Right now, this language prohibits that. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we have heard with, with you know, in free, we heard frequently from a lot of the hemp producers around the state is, is how much of their sales are from e-commerce and shipping to a number of different states, you know, were responsible for the products that are sold and bought in Vermont by Vermonters and those visiting the state of Vermont. If if a, if a different state has different, as we heard, a definition of what an intoxicating cannabis product is, 
you know, I think a safe harbor provision, you know, makes sense. And I think one of the questions that I've asked folks is I think it's quite clear um, that FDA is going to act over the next couple of years once they get the authority to do so through this farm bill on a lot of these hemp derived THC products. Um, do folks want to rip the bandaid off now and not be able to sell? Because I think FDA, when when they get um, the authority to regulate this, they're gonna they're gonna do so restrictively. I think it's gonna either be what we have presented or even more restrictive. So the fear of out of state competition for a, a state that maybe has a 1.75 milligram of THC, you know, um, limit and a 15 to one ratio. Eventually, those folks are gonna have to abide by what FDA is telling them to do, which is probably more in line with what we're telling them to do. Um, they can have a couple years of runway to kind of make that change themselves and have the safe harbor provision or rip the bandaid off and not do it now. And folks said that they wanted a couple years to figure it out. So I think that I think that makes sense. Julie, how do you feel about that? I agree with that. Yep. Okay. So, so Dave, I don't think a safe harbor provision would be that challenging to draft. I think a number of other states have them for these types of products. Are you are you willing to take a crack at that for the kind of publication of this? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I guess I can take that as an instruction from the board to add what would prob probably could be done concisely as a two one seven three D that would um, you know essentially define the protected activities in the same way that Colorado has. Um, I realize some listeners might not know what we're talking about. If you, you can Google pretty easily uh, Colorado Safe Harbor or something, um, and you'll see that what that state and a few others did to address this issue is to say, okay, you can't sell in, in our state, but you may export to, you may manufacture and export to states where they've decided that, that sale should be lawful. Um, so I, I'd be happy to give that a try and probably just in the form of a new sub D to 2173. Bring that to you. Actually, we could publish that. That would mean that we wouldn't be able to put our update on the web for about 24, 48 hours, but that's probably okay. I, I, yeah, I think, I think it's better to get to wait to, I mean, I think it's better to, to publish a little bit delayed, but have that provision in there so that people have a chance to see it. Because um, again, I think a lot of the controversy we heard over this emergency rule ended up not being about the substance, but about the kind of the actual language and it, that it was confusing to people. So I think uh, getting it out there uh, and not having it kind of sprung on people on the 19th would be helpful. Um, and I, I also don't think in, Julia, Kyle, I'm happy to be overruled on this, that we should have a safe harbor for Delta 8 and Delta 10 and the kind of synthetics, I, I think, or semi-synthetics, however you want to define them. I think it really should be related to um, products that maybe don't meet these uh, presumptions, the 1.5 per serving, the uh, 20 to 1 ratio. Yep, that's how I'm, that's how I'm thinking about it. And I, I think, you know, one of the things I talked with Gabe about this and just to fill you two in while we're all here, um, I think we heard from at least one person that um, has a retail store um, specific to um, hemp products. You know, the way these safe harbor provisions often work is the producer can sell um, into other states. And this retailer has a lot of e-commerce in this area. You know, if we just did a safe harbor from a producer relationship out of state, you know, they wouldn't be captured by the safe harbor. And I think Colorado has a, a safe harbor provision for a retail or two. Yes, they saw the same problem and they created kind of safe harbor for related entities that would be in the chain to also deal. Yeah. And again, just recognizing how how much e-commerce in the hemp products space is, is quite prevalent uh, as folks look for Vermont craft. CBD product, or I should say hemp product. Great. And, uh, you know, again, th these presumptions don't apply to the presumptions in 2.17.2 don't apply to 
smokable hemp flower. Is that, is that right? Just to be clear, that was a question that we got a few times when we were out on our tour. I think they do in the sense that the smokable hemp flower to which concentrated THC would have been artificially applied. No, well, I, think yes. people were, I think people were confused with, and it's again, they, they're not typically subject to our regulations, how we define cannabis and we define cannabis product. Mm -hmm. So cannabis product to them meant smokable flower, oh. not, not smokable flower that had been sprayed back on with Delta 9 THC or anything like that, just, just straight right. grown. Straight flower. flower. And I just said, look, we define cannabis product and we define cannabis. This right. isn't about cannabis products, not about the flower. Um, so I think that was, again, just getting used to how we define things in the CCD world versus how maybe the PH2 agriculture defined things before us. Yes, I think that I think that's accurate. But to be clear, cannabis flower, hemp flower to which artificial THC concentrate right. was reapplied becomes that's a product. product. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just uh, without that aspect, it wouldn't be subject to these. Thank you. I think that's exactly right. All right. Um, that's, that's the last on this one, and I don't have anything for roll four. Anyone else have anything on, on either two, one, two, or four? Just to clarify on 2.17, these are the rules for hemp products that fall into adult use. We haven't written any or forthcoming our rules around other hemp products. Is that right? That's a good point. There's the, the meta hemp rule right. is out there for the next. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, deferring action on these until next meeting, which means I think we can continue down our agenda. I'm sorry to everyone watching. Does anyone want to take a break, um, by the way? Bryn, are you okay? Okay. I'm going to just rock and roll. Everybody Dave, yep. do you need a, a, a mental health break, a leg stretch <laughs> break? <laughs> I might, but you don't have to hold up on my account. I can, I can go stretch and come back. You're free now. Okay. Well, do, do we want to take a vote on rule four? That's an excellent question. Did you want there? There is consensus, I believe, on rule four, and there's no notice issue on rule four. Nothing much has changed about it. Did you want as a body to approve rule four? for submission to LCAR right now, and then we'll be down to one or two. You know, I, I think that there's a good reason to do that, other than I don't, I didn't make that clarification when I announced it, just like, uh, you know, before we started this process that we were gonna do something different for rule four. So I, just given that I don't think anything is gonna change, except, you know, like, does it, so it'll make it onto the LCAR calendar for next month, as opposed to the month after? And there's probably a good reason that we have that in place sooner rather than later. It would give us, it would codify our appellate process in a way that isn't done right now. Okay. Well, then I'm fine with doing it. I, I mean, and we haven't received, we didn't receive any substantive comments on it today, um, or I don't think throughout the process, frankly. Um, so um, I'm fine with that. Julie and Kyle, are you comfortable with that? Yep. Yep. All right. Does someone have a motion to approve um, rule four for submission to LCAR? Uh, I move to approve the amendments to Cannabis, Cannabis Control Board Administrative Rule Four as presented to us in this meeting. That's nice. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Great. Um, so looking down the agenda for today, I think we're up to the recommendations, um, executive director report and staff recommendations. Yep. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with the executive director report and as the chair mentioned um, in his opening comments, I think that we will take a pause um, at the end of the report on the data. Um, to go into executive session to discuss staff recommendations on um, social equity status. Oh, uh oh, hold on.
Okay, so I'll try and scoot through these a little bit since we've um, been at this for a long time. Um, it's actually a little bit of a shorter update than usual, um, just given where we are in the year. So it shouldn't take quite as long as it normally does. Um, so I'll start with our public engagement updates um, since our last board meeting. Um, as noted, uh, there was quite a bit of um, public engagement on the hemp emergency rule and the language that you just reviewed in rule two governing um, hemp derived products. So that made up the bulk of our public engagement in the last month, the hemp listening tour um, between July 13th or June 13th and June 19th. We also had a Q&A session um, on that uh, emergency rule. And we also did a Q&A session early in the month on the medical program. Um, so what will be coming up uh, in the next couple of months is the medical program stakeholder group meetings. And as um, we have, we, we are compiling a list of uh, stakeholders that have reached out to us that would like to participate in this effort. Um, and if you haven't reached out to us to indicate that you'd like to participate, you can email um, ccb.med at vermont.gov as the chair indicated in the opening remarks. Um, so those meetings haven't been scheduled yet. They will be scheduled fairly soon. Um, the schedule will be posted to the website with links to join. Um, but if you would specifically like to hear about them, uh, send, send an email and we will include you as a part of the stakeholder group. So as I do every month, um, I'm updating the public and the board on what guidance documents have been amended and updated and posted to the website. So in the last, since the last board meeting, we've, um, we've put through updates to our fencing guidance, um, our mapping and GPS coordinates, coordinates guidance and also the local control commission guidance. Um, so those are all new and updated to the website, so check them out. So I'll move to our licensing data for the adult use program. Um, starting out with our, uh, our chart that demonstrates our average number of days from submission to approval based on license type. Um, this chart over time just demonstrates that we're pretty consistent. Um, taking around uh, 90 days to review cultivation applications um, and less than that for every other license type. Um, employee ID cards are hovering around 58 days right now. So still real consistent data here. Um, this is our new submission slide. So um, all of the new cannabis establishment applications that we've gotten um, in the month of June are here, um, and you can see they're broken out by, by status. So in the last month, we've gotten um, the majority of our new submissions have been from social equity applicants, eight of them. Uh, six of them are from standard applicants and three from economic empowerment. Um, and this obviously represents a significant decline um, since May. And that is due to uh, the closure of our outdoor application, outdoor and mixed application windows. So you can see May, there was a huge um, increase in the number of new applications that we got. And that was um, due to, again, the, the fact that the board is closed the outdoor and mixed um, cultivation application window. So um, these numbers are always reflective of new, new license applications, not renewals. Um, and so this is a summary of our renewal submissions. We've got 27 renewals that were submitted um, in the, since the last board meeting. Um, the majority of them, 75%, are standard applicants, um, about 11% are social equity applicants, and 15% are economic empowerment applicants. And the licensing team is working on developing some comparison data um, to demonstrate how many of our social equity applicants we and all other status of applicants we are retaining. Um, and okay, and this is the just is just a summary of our new submissions by type of license. Um, so we've got you know about six cultivation, five retail, uh, four manufacturer, and one wholesale application. New app as of this month. Here's our slide um, demonstrating the total number of issued licenses. 
So we are still around 56% of our issued licenses are to small cultivators. Um, we're up to 58 retail licenses that we've issued at this point. Um, and this seems like a good place to note that I, that I haven't included for this month um, the total license canopy slide that I normally provide to you. We're going to hold um, that information to the later summer meetings when we have a more accurate assessment of um, how much space our licensed cultivators are utilizing this grow season. Um, this slide shows our renewals um, since last month. So we've got nine renewals in total that have been done. About half of them are cultivator renewals. Um, and the other half, I think, are wholesalers and manufacturers that renewed off cycle. Um, this is a summary of what else the licensing team is doing um, that's sort of happening outside of these board meetings. So uh, we've gotten 24 amendments to issued licenses. Um, and so far we've issued uh, over 550 employee ID cards um, and that includes renewals. So we've got 11 renewals that we've processed so far for the employee. Um, another synopsis of, of what licensing is doing outside of the board meetings, we've gotten um, around 450 new submissions um, in the last month since the last board meeting. So those are all things that the licensing team is processing. Here's our retail map um, of retail locations in the state. Um, looks pretty similar to how it did last month. Um, you can see this is the zoom in on your area of density, which is Burlington. Um, and we've got the full Burlington map on the left and the downtown map on your right, which shows um, how these issued retail licenses um, are dispersed in that area. Um, as for other areas of density, this is your sort of chart that describes um, where else in the state you're seeing uh, density of retail establishments. Um, there's only, the change from last month is just a reduction. So um, there was, there's one fewer, um, there's one less retail application in the queue for Burlington. Um, because we did have a withdrawal there. So no, no upward um, trends this month. So moving on to product registration, um, this is just the status of our product registration submissions um, by the numbers. So we've gotten just under um, 2,300 total product registration applications in the door, um, the majority of them just under 2,000 uh, have been registered. We've got 267 that are currently in submitted status, so those are awaiting review. 16 are currently under review. We've got 42 that have been resubmitted, so those are also awaiting our review. And then 340 are incomplete and um, need additional information from the licensee to in order to register those. Um, here's the breakdown of product registration by the status they're in. It's just a different way of looking at the same thing. Um, and then here we've got a breakdown of the product type um, for product registration. And this includes all um, of the products that have been submitted. So they are registered. This includes registered products and products that are still um, in other statuses. So you can see the, the about 75% is still flower. Um, we've got 10% each for extracts and edibles, and then those smaller um, slivers of the pie are tinctures and topicals. I think we're at 2% for topicals right now, 3% for tinctures. So um, little, little micro changes um, in this chart over, over the months. Okay, I'll move on to our compliance data now. Um, so starting with advertising, um, again, this is the slide shows a summary of uh, our advertising submissions and the staff decisions on advertising since we started reviewing these submissions last November. Um, you can see the, so at the top, the top bullet there, we've gotten 113 submissions um, so far. And our approval and denial rate in the last 
few months has been about half and half. So that's improving um, over time. We've approved 57 now, denied 42. Um, and again, the reasons for denial since the, the majority of the time we are denying because there's a failure on the part of the licensee to meet that um, requirement that they demonstrate a 15% threshold for the youth audience composition. Um, and second to that is a failure to include the health warnings. And then we've got other reasons uh, that fall below. Um, so moving on to our inspections. Um, so we've got six compliance agents that are out in the field. Um, just a, a brief correction there, um, something that was stated earlier. Um, there's six of them and they've done 97 total inspections this month. And there's the breakdown of license type. Um, and investigations, we've in the last, uh, since the last board meeting, we've uh, undertaken 30 new investigations. And those investigations are about um, the list that you see there. 18 new complaints have been received since May 18th. Um, and we've issued two notices of violation um, since the last board meeting. One uh, for reasons of on site consumption, and another for a violation of the emergency rule uh, requirements. I'm going to chug along. And I'm sure everyone will, anyone will interrupt me if there's any questions. Um, so for the medical program, um, this is the initial slide that shows the sort of dramatic decrease over time. I did for this meeting include the data on 2023, even though we're only halfway through. Um, so this reflects um, the, the significant drop just um, since 2022 over the last six months. Um, in the, since 2022, we've had almost a 600 uh, patient drop. Um, and over 100 caregivers have dropped from the program just since um, the data that was collected in 2022. And you can see that here. Um, just a little dropping a little bit uh, every month. So, you know, perfect, perfect timing for the board to undertake um, the medical stakeholder program work to think about ways to improve access to the program. OK, so with that, um, I, before I move on to the staff recommendations, it's my suggestion that we um, take a pause for executive session to discuss um, an applicant that um, has applied for social equity status. OK, thanks for that, Brandon. It's really I know that that's a lot of work to put that together every month and it's a lot of work. It represents a lot of work too, uh, done by the staff. So thank you to the staff as well for everything you're doing. Um, why don't we take a break? I have a feeling um, this one's going to require a little bit, just having read the recommendation, a little bit of time, uh, I hate to say. But um, why don't we say 25 minutes um, and we'll shoot for 430 and um, it, who knows, maybe we'll get done sooner, um, but why don't we, Nellie, if you're still there, I don't know if you had to run, pick up your child. I'm still here. I made arrangements. OK, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, could you say 430? And, um, you know, again, we, we may get done sooner. I can't say for sure, um, but uh, we'll shoot for 430. OK, that sounds good. Get that up. Ever, should we move? Chair, are, oh, you, sorry. are you suggesting that we move into executive <laughs> session or take a break? I'm sorry, I'm confused. Uh, could I have a motion to move into executive session? I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services to the body and that the executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at a substantial dis disadvantage. I further move that the board invite Susanna Davis, executive director and Jay Green, Racial Equity Research and Policy Analyst from the Office of Racial Equity for the State of Vermont into executive session. Aye, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay.
All right, I'm going to hand the reins over to Ray and um, we are still recording. OK, um, so we're out of executive session. Um, just for the record, it's uh, 442 p.m. on. Uh, oh, I'm in June 26th, 2023. And. Um, we I think um, are ready to look at the staff recommendations. OK, so um, we've got here is our list for this month on staff recommendations for social equity status. Um, so we've got five uh, recommendations for social equity status approval this month. Submission number three, six, four, three. Submission number. Oh, this looks like an incorrect submission number. Um, I'm going to guess that it's submission number one, three, four, five. Um, and we will get that corrected. Um, submission number 3351, submission number 4452, submission number 3881. Um, we will get a correction on that second submission number, which looks just one digit too long. Um, so uh, that is our list of applicants that have met the criteria for a social equity business applicant or social equity individual applicant as required by board rule for um, access to the social equity program. Um, and I've just gotten confirmation that it's 1345. Um, the second submission number is 1345, not 21345. Thank you, Ray. <clears throat> um, okay, and then the next set of recommendations is uh, staff recommendations for licensure. So the businesses on the following pages have um, all demonstrated compliance with the requirements for their license that are contained in board rule and in statute. And I'm not um, going to read the list to you because it is long. Um, and I don't even remember exactly how long it is, but it's, it's three pages long. So here's your list. One, two, three pages of businesses that have demonstrated um, their appropriateness for licensure. That is the list. We will have it published on the website um, this evening. And the last page is our staff recommendations for license renewal. And um, that's another long one, so I'm not going to read those either. But um, given that it's the end of a very long board meeting, I don't think anyone will mind that I'm not reading. Really I mind. <laughs> Besides you, you're the only one to mind. All right, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> OK, all right, um, so these for those who join by the phone will be posted uh, to our website. Um, I think Brent said hopefully this evening, if not tomorrow. Um, so you will be able to see um, everyone that got approved. And is there a motion to approve the staff recommendations for social equity and licensure? I move to approve the staff recommendations made to us in this meeting. A second. Any discussion? Nope. Nope. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you for that, Bryn. Thanks, Gabe, for your help. Thanks to the whole licensing team and compliance team. And why don't we move to public comment? So um, I know it's a long, it's been a long day, but if you'd like to uh, make a public comment, uh, you join by the link. Please raise your virtual hand. I, I can call on you in the order that you um, that you raise them, and um, then we'll shift to folks that join via the phone. Bobby Berg, I'm going to unmute you in a second. Here we go. Hi, uh, I'll spare you all more on the 2.24 talk as you'll be getting uh, some written uh, thoughts on that soon enough. Uh, I just wanted to briefly make a suggestion for product registration, and that is to uh, allow licensees to update them while they are in submission. Uh, I understand that, you know, uh, applications are considered in the order they are approved i think it would probably be pretty easy to automate a system to that would you know requeue anything that's edited so it doesn't like jump queue or anything um 
just i mean i'm personally in a situation right now where i've had a pending uh registration for like four months i think and i noticed something wrong with it on the resubmission and i can't edit the uh resubmitted thing until it is reviewed so you know by the time this product gets to the shelves it's gonna be like six seven months you know uh anyways figured that might streamline things thanks a bunch thanks bobby tito Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So thank you so much to everybody who worked on that vape tax. Uh, it's so incredible that actually that actually happened. So thank you. And uh, quickly, um, definitely would love to see the removal of the cessation of operations escrow, and uh, also agree with Pepper about not dictating low THC products or guidance or however that was working. Um, thank you. Hope you have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Tito. Anyone else who joined via the link, um, just raise your virtual hand. And if you join by phone and would like to comment, um, you can hit star six to unmute your phone. Just give it one last minute here. I don't see anybody coming off mute that's on the phone, Pepper, but. Okay. One Maybe. Uh, phone nope. number ending Nobody in did. 7141. Uh, if you if you join by a phone and your number ends in 7141, we just saw that you unmuted. If you'd like to make a comment, now's the time. Uh, no, I was, we were watching online and I just, we lost everything and gotcha. I was trying to figure out how the votes went. Oh, okay. Yeah, we we approved all of the licenses that were up um, for right that were recommended to us. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. And I know there's a number of people that joined by the phone. We'll we'll make it make sure that list is posted um, so you all can see who was approved. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Going once, twice. All right. I'll close the public comment window and um, just want to thank everyone for sticking it out, both on the CCB side and on the kind of participant side. Um, we'll see you again July 19th. And I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>